Located at the heart of Dubai lies Cityland Mall, redefining retail, entertainment and green sustainability. Well positioned on the E311, Cityland Mall has a catchment to more than one million of the city's most affluent residents and direct access to key visitor attraction, Global Village. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome CEO of the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers, David McAdam. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. Our 25th anniversary of the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers. So it's a milestone in many ways. And I really wanted to thank each and every one of you for coming and joining us today. I know in the room next door where all the food is, there's probably another 100 people. And I was trying to uh, marshal them in here. And they just said, is there any food there? And I said, they said, if there's no food, we're not coming. So we'll start. We'll make some noise. But anyway, good morning, everyone. I'm David McAdam. And thank you again for being here. What I wanted to start with was last night we had an amazing cocktail reception. We launched. We gave away some awards for our sponsors who were very special for us. I also was able to um, give away our book, which is called uh, Souks to Malls, Retail Entertainment in the Gulf. And I want everyone to make sure before they leave this event whether it's today or tomorrow, whenever is the last time you're here, please bring a copy of this book with you. It's the dedication and hard work of our MECSC team. And Leah, Merez, all the rest of the team did a fantastic job, and Justin Espiritu, of putting together this book. What we wanted to do with it was create a snapshot in time of what's available today in this region in terms of uh, entertainment, recreation, leisure, and food and beverage. And it's, it's a very timely piece because I think everyone knows here now, or if you don't know, you'll know by the end of this conference, that food and beverage, entertainment, and leisure, leisure and recreation is playing a much larger role in our shopping center environments. So the book is great. It's available for you for free. And after this, we're going to start charging $10,000 a copy. So get it free now. It's going to be better. What I also wanted to do was to tell everyone about the rest of the day and who we have. And we have some amazing speakers. Um, they will be introduced to you by our MC, who I'll introduce in just a second. But let me go through first by talking about our sponsors. And I know that in this um, environment, People are challenged from time to time about having an extra spend for marketing or to do anything that might help raise their profile or to do anything that might help them facilitate their business. But that's what we do. Our team every day gets together and we help people to raise their personal profile in the industry. And we do that locally, regionally, and globally. And I want everyone to understand that we're here to help for our members and the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers, if there's anything, and I mean this, anything that you may need that we can do to help you in doing your business, facilitating what you're doing, or raising your personal profile, all you need to do is ask. My phone's on 24-7. Everyone that I try and give a card to says, I've already got three. I've got six. I don't need any more. I know, how to, I know where I'm going to find you. So please, you know where I am. You know what I can do. We can help you. We have our Retail People magazine. In our Retail People magazine, it's a fabulous, fabulous, every quarter we come out and we have um, wonderful photographs, we have great articles, we have chances for people to get known in the industry. And I know I'll ask everyone one more time because I know Merez sits there at the end of the day and goes, well, we have lots of articles, but we need more. And all I'm saying is, please, we want you to be part of this. The only way you could be part of it is to connect with us, ask us. Anybody who wants to write an article about the retail industry, about your experiences, come to us. We'll publish it, and then you can get recognized. It helps you to raise your personal profile in the industry. So the retail people is a, a fabulous way to go on that. The other thing is our directory and our directory uh, 
Justin has made it grow. We have about 745 shopping centers in it now. We have over 1,000 retailers. So it's all fairly exciting when you look at that because it's, um, as some people say, it's the directory to doing business in the region. So please, also in your bags and all your delegate bags, so thank you everyone for the contributions to the delegate bag. Our contribution has been the directory and the magazine and a few other things and the rest of our sponsors I'm going to talk to you about now. One of the joys of my life is to treat this event as kind of an event to get together with a lot of old friends that I've known in the industry. It's been 15 years now in this region for me and I've met some great people and had a lot of fabulous times with all of them helping them and also learning from them. And that's what I urge you to do too. Our associate partner, Dubai Association Center, which you can see on the screen behind us, that's uh, Hassan Al Hashimi and his team. And I think the association partnership that we have with, the, with the Dubai Association Center has helped us as an organization to become known. We are now, just so you're aware, the largest not-for-profit organization in the GCC. So that's thanks to all of you for being members of the organization. So I wanted to thank you for that. As a matter of fact, they get us flying around the world talking about what we do. But I would like to thank everyone, first of all. Please join me in thanking everyone here <laughs> for your support. Thanks very much. Our platinum sponsors this year, Arabia Nude, and we really thank you for all of the work that you've done. You've also been a fabulous support for us in terms of um, last night's cocktail party by underwriting that, so thank you very much, the opening kickoff. Also, Cells Events, Alessandro Gaffari, they have the premier spot on the floor, he tells me, and I'm agreeing. He's out there now, and uh, Alessandro has been a huge supporter of the organization for many years. We thank you for that. Afgar Lighting is another one of his companies. Then for gold sponsors, we have Dalma Mall, and Bupinder Singh and I have known each other for many years, and Bupinder keeps supporting us in every way that we can and that we ask him, and it's, it's wonderful. Unified Asset and Property Management, the team there, there's Amarin, Robert, and others. Thank you so much for your support. Al Raji Investment as well, thank you so much. Line Investments, Marcello is also a board member, but he's also a strong supporter of the organization. I think everybody knows Marcello as well, very well. Gulf Related are a strong supporter as well, and they're launching a new shopping center soon. And Daniel Perry was our cover boy in one of the last uh, Retail People magazines. And by the way, we're always looking for a new cover person on our Retail People magazine. So if you're not afraid to be on the cover of our magazine, we'd be more than happy to do that as well. Red Sea Mall, thank you as well. Again, they've been continual supporters for many, many years, so we thank you for that. Bill Fordyce with Backlight Media, thank you for your support and what you've done. And Jetta Park, thank you very much as well as a gold sponsor. Let me just go on to the next page. I'm going to read through all of these because everyone who has contributed to the success of our organization must and needs to be recognized today. Food Elite, thank you so much. They have a great booth in the sponsorship just out here, so thank you for your support. V-Count Technology with facial recognition, they have a booth out here as well. Thank you for them. Keenan International Real Estate Development, thank you so much for that. Retail Emotions, so Dr. Kirsten and his team, thank you for being here again with us this year. The Al Hoker Group, thank you for that. It's great to have you here as a silver sponsor as well. Hamad Property Group, thank you for being here as well. And I know some of the team from Hamad have just come here as well. Alothame Leisure and Tourism, Fahad was with us last night at the opening, so thank you for all of your support through all the years at Alothame. Thank you. And then Tam Dean Group and GLA, thank you for David Saunders and Navajit and his team and the rest of the team that's here. Christian was even here last night. Great to see everybody together again. And we had a great networking event held at 360 Mall in Kuwait. I think it was, uh, I've lost track of time, maybe last month, earlier this month. Granada Investment. So Mazen, I've known for many years, and Mazen has really taken this new direction with Granada, uh, 
rebranding Granada Center to Granadia, and he's going to explain a little bit about that later, so we'll talk about that. But thanks for your support. Buzz Management and Consultancy, Beju and Seju, I saw you here. Beju's not here yet, but he will be later today. Thank you for your support. As we are hosting these events, I want you to understand a little bit about what we do now. Hosting an event in Dubai has become a little bit more complicated than it has been in the past. And you need to have the proper authorities, you need to have the proper clearances, you need to have the proper registration, you have to use the right barcodes, you have to check a lot of boxes. And it's through us partnering and doing some work with BUZ, Beiju and his team that we've been able to host this event as well because it is much more complicated. OptiFashion are here and thank you so much for your support. By the way, if you're interested in the high technology approach to eyewear, it's amazing if you go and they have a facial recognition uh, screen in front and then they put on glasses that digitally that make you look great. So I'm going to go back and look for some more there too. But it was really fun this morning at their booth. Over the years, Yardi have been huge supporters, and I know that I've always appreciated the support that we've had from Saeed and his, fam and his group of uh, people that are in the office with him, Oksana as well. Sharjah Investment Development Authority, Sharuk, thank you for your support again this year. Blanchard Illumination, thank you. Expand Retail and Savant Data Systems, Vic Bagaria, thank you for being here as well. Jones Lang LaSalle, JLL, are also with us, and we thank them for their support. And I know that there's been some new leadership there, and we've, uh, we're looking forward to doing some work with JLL again in other ways. Life on screen marketing management. So there's a new startup business that started, and um, Nitya, Usha, and Susan Siebert are, are part of that team. We thank you for your support as well. Sharper Track, George and Malcolm, thank you for always being with us. We really appreciate your support always. It means a lot to us to have your support. As an official exhibitor contractor, Kingsman Middle East has done a fabulous job again. And I know anyone who's worked with, this, uh, with us outside in the exhibition area has worked with Mirage and his team. And Mirage has done this for a number of years. He does a fabulous job. So thank you so much for that. Now, in terms of exhibitors, I think you probably already had a chance to go and have a look at some of them, but I urge you to go and have a look at what our exhibitors are doing. In this, these days and times, we're blessed as an organization, MECSC, to have the support of our exhibitors to come spend their time, effort, energy, and money to invest with us to promote their businesses. So please have a look and see what the exhibitors do and I'm going to go through the list, and I want to make sure, I'm not going to spend much time on it, but Arabian Oud sells events, Afgar Lighting, Dalma Mall, Unified Asset Property Management, Al Raji Investment, Line Investments, Jeddah Park, Oud Elite, V Count, Retail Emotions, Al Care Group, Alothame Leisure and Tourism, BUZ Management, Opta Fashion, Blanchard Illumination, Expand Retail, and the Savant Team. Amusement Services, International LLC, Blue Rhine Industries, they've got a great stand there as well. Cafe Saraydan, thank you for your participation. Funtopia, Inline Logic IT Solutions, JB Brands Management, LP Flex Base Industry, MacArthur and Company, Phil's been with us for many years, thank you. MK Illumination, Premier Marketing Management, and we have a new one now too, and Paul Rayson is here with his team from Jelly Belly Ice Cream, and they've got a, a very cute and interesting uh, booth you must go and have a look at. Our support partners, Solution BI uh, Middle East, our support partners include CBRE, Damani, Ream Mall, CBRE, I mentioned, Access Communication, Crystal House Sharjah, Nearby Group, Oleander Flowers, AZDEF Group with Rayan, uh, InLogic, and then for our media partners, we have Selfie TV and Forbes Middle East. Joni, we have some other things on the slide. You want to run them through, and I'll read them off here. Maybe it's a little easier. So our conference break and lunch and the gala gift bag is Lion Investments, and we really appreciate your support in providing this. 
The lunch, just so that you're aware, is up on the P level, P for podium, in the Cara restaurant. So that'll start after the conclusion of our events today, round two, or thereabouts. The next one, please. Conference delegate bag and exclusive gala dinner, golf related, are supporting that with their sponsorship. Thank you so much for that. The welcome cocktail reception last night, Arabian Nude, it was a huge success. So thank you for your support there. Pre awards dinner. That's Cityland Mall, so we really appreciate your support for being with us for this and the launch of your new shopping center. The exclusive pre-awards gala dinner cocktail reception is also uh, a part of what they're uh, providing for us in the MECSC, so thank you, Cityland Mall. Ream Mall, the lanyard, so thank you very much, Shane, and your team. Thanks for your support, as always. We really appreciate it. Delegate badge, you'll see uh, uh, the CBRE logo on our delegate badge as well. So thank you, CBRE, for your participation. So this is our 25th anniversary, and now we're going to kick off. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite to the stage a very special new MC that we have. And I'm very pleased to have her with us. We're actually very lucky to have her with us. Uh, Rania Ali comes... Um, She's a, a special presenter in the market, um, regionally, locally, regionally, but she's also um, she's a spokesperson for the Ministry of the Economy for the Dubai government. So please join me in welcoming on stage Rania Ali, who's going to do the rest of this, and you won't have to see me so much. So please, Rania, come to the stage. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, David, for the very warm welcome. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaba bikum. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rania Ali, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you this morning in what will be a fantastic conference. I'm very much looking forward to the line of speakers that we have today. Recon 2018 celebrates 25th anniversary. Can I have a very big round of applause for this, please? We're so delighted to be bringing you once again this year industry experts and fantastic speakers organized by the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers. Recon Middle East and North Africa 2018 will bring together shopping center industry professionals retailers, management and consulting companies, architects and design companies, entertainment and leisure companies, product and service providers to the industry all under one roof for three consecutive days of networking, deal making and exploring new business opportunities. So without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our first speaker for today to do the welcome address. Mr. Yunus Al Mullah, Chairman, Middle East Council of Shopping Centers, is a professional qualified in retail management and retail development operations in a very highly competitive market with an entrepreneurial spirit and a very sharp business acumen. He is very well experienced in fields of operations of shopping centers, including daily operations, marketing, leasing, projects, sales, and marketing. Let's please all give him a very big round of applause and welcome him to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rania. Thank you, David. Well, I'm going to talk with two languages and very short, to be very honest with you. First of all, I would like to thank you, the whole members and MCSC, to appoint me as the chairman of Middle East Shopping Council. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And today I'm very proud to see His Highness Prince Bandar bin Khalid. He's joining us. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Ashab al-Sa'ada, Fakhamat al rais الضيوف الكرام سيداتي وسادتي مرحبا بكم في ركن الذي يحتفل بالذكرى السنوي 25 لمجلس مراكز التسوق في الشرق الأوسط معكم يونس الملا رئيس مجلس إدارة مراكز تسوق الشرق الأوسط 
نشكركم على انضمامنا إلينا في هذا الحدث الكبير خلال هذه السنة ونحن متحمسون جدا لمشاركتكم ونتعرف معكم على أحدث الاتجاهات في قطاع البيع التجزئة محليا وإقليميا وعالميا شكرا لجميع الرعاة وشكرا لفريق مجلس إدارة مراكز التسوق على الجهود الذي بذلوه من أجل تخطيط لهذا الحدث والعمل على إطلاق شراء الأولى له ويسعدني أيضا أن أتقدم بالشكر لكم جميعا لانضمامكم إلينا هذا اليوم Your Highness Your Excellency Honor Guest Ladies and Gentlemen Welcome to your Turicon Conference which is celebrating 25th of anniversary of Middle East of Shopping Council today. I'm Yunus al Mulam, Chairman of MCEC and thank you for joining here to the large event of the year and we are excited to share with you and to learn together about the latest trend of the retail industry locally, regionally and globally. And thank you to all juniors, to their sponsors and thank you to the MCMC, MCSC team for their hard work and planning to put this event together. And we don't want to forget and thank you to all juniors today. And I would like to add one more thing. I think today we have a two days and a, an excellent speaker, they will be on the stage and globally. I'm sure will be some of them locally and globally and uh, they're gonna talk about the industry of the retail. And please, uh, I would like to share that. Try to ask as much question you would like to those speakers and you can get some benefits of that and take with you and implement with your work. And this event, I believe this is one of the unique events that could be happen. And every six months we have done, they have done a very hard work by David and team to put together to build that network. And from the network, I believe that to start the business. Finally, I would like to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eunice, for the uh, welcome address, and thank you, Your Excellency, for joining us today as well. I'd like to welcome uh, on the, to the stage Marwan Iskandarani. He's joined Kamal Jamjoum Group in 1999 on a sales force, then grown in six months to managing retail operations in KSA. He then supported the opening of operations in the GCC states, and in 2006, he took over the business development function of the company and managed to acquire and open 500 plus stores across the entire region. Today, as a group retail and property manager, he manages over 750 leads across six countries and over more than 50 cities. Let's please all welcome Marawan to the stage with a very big round of applause. Good morning, everyone. I guess I'm going to get Rania to write my CV. That looks very impressive. With your permission, I'd like to give my speech first in Arabic, then followed by English. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad, ashraf al-anbiya wa akram al-mursaleen. Ashab al-sumu, ashab al-ma'ali, ashab al-sa'ada, al-hudur al-kareem. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa marhaban bikum fi mu'tamarina al-sanawi wa aladhi yusadif hadha al-aam الاحتفال بمرور 25 عاما منذ انشاء مجلس مراكز التسوق للشرق الاوسط. كل عام وانتم بخير. محدثكم مروان اسكندراني لقد استمتعت خلال العامين المنصرمين بدوري كرئيس للمجلس اداره في المجلس ولا يسعني من هنا سوى ان اتقدم بالشكر للسيدات والساده اعضاء المجلس وهم السيده ميمونه الشيباني، الاستاذ محمد اقبال علوي، الاستاذ اندرو ويليامسون، الأستاذ لوكا كابتشيتي، الأستاذ أفيجيت ياداف، والأستاذ خالد الجاسر على جهودهم المبذولة والإنجازات المحققة خلال الفترة المذكورة ويسعدني أن أشارككم ببعض هذه الإنجازات من أفضل إنجازاتنا الحقيقة أننا أقنعنا الأستاذ يونس الملا ليتولى دور رئيس مجلس إدارة التسوق ليتولى رئيس مجلس إدارة مراكز التسوق للشرق الأوسط وانتهت هذه الفرصة ليتقدم بالشكر الجزيل 
لسعادة ماجد الغرير على قيامه بهذا الدور لل25 عاما المنصرمة وأشكر الأستاذ يونس للملة على قبوله أن يتولى هذا الدور المهم والحيوي للمجلس كما أنه بفضل الله تعالى تم تعاون مع زملاء والتعاون مع الزملاء قمنا بوضع الأسس الرئيسية لتغيير طبيعة العمل والعلاقة مع المجلس العالمي لمراكز التسوق نحو الأفضل وديفيد سيقوم بالتوضيح فيما بعد كما بلغ عدد المشاركين في مؤتمرنا السنوي للعام الفائت ما يزيد عن ثلاثة ألاف مشارك وذلك أيضا أعلى رقم تم تسجيله للزوار في عام خلال العامين الفائتين بلغ عدد أعضاء المجلس أكثر من أي وقت مضى قمنا أيضا بترجمة وتعديل العديد من البرامج التدريبية المعتمدة لدى, مجلس لدى المجلس العالمي لمراكز تسوق وتم بالفعل طرحها في عدة دورات تدريبية وأخيرا يسعدني أن أبلغكم بالنيابة عن الزملاء في مجلس الإدارة بأننا سنترك هذه الدورة ومجلس ومركز المجلس المالي أفضل من أي وقت مضى وكما وأنه سيكون جاهزا بحلته الجديدة للنمو والتطور واليوم نتطلع أنا وزملائي في مجلس الإدارة إلى نتائج الترشيح لمجلس إدارة الدورة القادمة ونحن بدورنا نتعهد بتقديم كل ما نستطيع لمساعدتهم بالمضي قدما لما فيه مصلحة صناعة التجزئة في الشرق الأوسط كما أتقدم بالشكر الجزيل لفريق العمل الموهوب والذي قام بتحقيق الإنجازات المذكورة وغيرها بقيادة الأستاذ ديفيد مكادم وفريقه المكون كل من السيدة ليا فانزويلا السيد السيدة خايا كوماندا السيد جاستن اسبريتو السيدة ماريز ماتوكدو السيد كريستيان بالدونانزا والسيد جي سي جايوما وأخيرا أشكر الحضور الكريم وكل من قدم لنا يد العون والمساندة خلال الدورة الفائتة كما أتمنى لكم مؤتمرا ناجحا ومثمرا لكم ولأعمالكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, Honored Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Welcome to the Recon Conference, our 25th anniversary for the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers. My name is Marwan Iskandarani. I have enjoyed my role as the President of the Board of Directors for the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers over the past two years. Please join me thanking the current Board of Directors, Mr. Muhammad Iqbal Alawi, Mr. Andrew Williamson, Mr. Luca Copacitti, Mr. Marcelo Larzerea, Ms. Maimuna, Ms. Mrs. Maimuna Shebani, Mr. Abijad Yadav, and Mr. Khalid Al Jasser. Our board has worked very hard and achieved goals, uh, great things over the past two years. As a president of the board over time, it gives me a great pleasure to outline our progress of, as an organization. We have engaged a new chairman. Mr. Yunus Al Mullah to take over the role of chairman of, from His Excellency Majid Al Ghurair, which I take this opportunity to thank Mr. Majid Al Ghurair for the 25 support to the council and thank Yunus for taking this vital role for the organization. We have laid the groundwork for, the, for establishing a new relationship with the International Council of Shopping Center, which I am confident that David will, be, will elaborate further on this at some point. We have worked to secure more members for the Middle East Council of Shopping Center more than any time previously. Last year in 2017, we succeeded in reaching all-time high number of delegates in the Recon Conference with 3,000 plus delegates as measured by our sponsors, people counting devices. We have established and translated and delivered custom programs the Arabic version of Middle East Council of Shopping Center and International Council of Shopping Centers training programs. And we will leave the Middle East Council of Shopping Center on a solid financial footing and ready more than any time before for future of growth and continued promotion of the retail industry in MENA region. We look forward in welcoming the new slate of elected board of, board of directors and we pledge to do everything we can to support them and give them a helping hand in moving forward the organization. Thank you also for the very talented and hard, hard working team of, at the Middle East Council of Shopping Center headed by David McAdam, who also 
supported by a very capable team of Lia Venezuela, Chaya Comanda, Justin Espirito, Mariz Moticado, and Christian Baldonanza, and JC Gayoma. I'd like to thank you all for making the time to be here today, and I wish you a fruitful recon for you and your businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marwan, for your speech. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our very first keynote speaker, David Merman Scott. Based in Boston, David is an international speaker, and he spoke in more than 40 countries. He's an expert in online marketing strategy with the latest best-selling book, The New Rules of Marketing. David is the online marketing strategist that I am very much personally looking forward to learn a lot from today. Not only that, David is really very persuasive. I was watching one of his presentations last night on sales, and I have to say his trip to Antarctica made me feel like I have to go to Antarctica. So ladies and gentlemen, let's all please welcome David to the stage with a very big round of applause. Thank you so much. It's so awesome to be here. How's everybody doing today? Good? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you very much. So, we're going to talk about a new model for marketing. A new model for marketing. And the reason is because the way that people buy has completely changed. The way all of us buy has changed, and it doesn't matter whether it's in the consumer markets or the business-to-business -business markets. Speaking of Antarctica, ever since I was seven years old, I wanted to go to Antarctica. So I said to my wife, Yukari, let's go to Antarctica. And she said, no, there's no way I'm going to go to Antarctica. So now I have a problem. I have to convince her to go with me to Antarctica. So I went to the Google machine. I typed in Antarctic travel, and I got a whole bunch of search results. But look at what was happening when I started to look at the companies I was finding. The first one I looked at, National Geographic, a big old button here that says request a reservation. But I'm not ready to request a reservation I'm just interested in learning more about Antarctica. Then I found this company, but look at what they were doing. They said, fill out the form and become our sales lead. I don't want to become your sales lead. I'm just trying to gather information about going to Antarctica. Then I found the low cost provider. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to the bottom of the world on the cheapest one. No, thank you. Then I found Quark Expeditions. This is the company that was educating me. This is the company that was informing me. This is the company that was providing information that I was sharing with my wife. I said, look, Yukari, we can drink beer and watch icebergs float by. She said, I don't want to go to Antarctica. I said, look at these amazing animals we can see. Wouldn't you love to see a chinstrap penguin? And my wife said, sure, I'd see the penguin in a zoo. So I'm still not making any progress here. Then I did what many of us do. I went to my social networks. So I went to I Facebook and I went to Twitter. I said, has anyone been to Antarctica? Then something extremely interesting happened. Because Quark Expeditions, in real time, connected with me in Twitter. Now, that's really interesting. They were following Twitter, saw that I mentioned the word Antarctica. Then I was connected with the CEO of Quark Expeditions, Hans. We then connected on, Facebook, on uh, LinkedIn as well. That's really cool. And then... I said to my wife, let's go to Antarctica. She said, I'm not going with you. And I said, oh my gosh, why not? And she said, David, she admitted to me, I'm afraid of throwing up. 
when we cross the Drake Passage. This crazy length of ocean. I'm afraid of getting sick. Aha, now I know the reason she doesn't want to go. So I reached out to Quark Expeditions again, and I said, help. I want to go to Antarctica, but my wife is afraid. And they said, send her this information. So the first thing they sent was information about the ship that we were going to be on, the Ocean Diamond. They sent me a page on their website about seasickness. Then they sent me a link to a blog post written by a doctor about seasickness. And then they sent me this video, which I then shared with my wife. I will watch it now, it's very short. The Drake Passage extends about 600 miles between Cape Horn and the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula and takes between one and a half and two days to cross. A lot of people are fearful of the Drake Passage. Don't be scared because uh, it's just as often calm as it is rough. It is one of the most majestic habitats on this planet for bird life. We have ships that have done this many times. We have ships that are built to travel around the world. They are safe. Have no fear of it. You shouldn't be anxious about it. You should recognize that it's a journey that has to be done. That's part of the process of going to the Antarctic. Be prepared. So if you think you may be at seasick, make sure you have medications. We'll certainly look after you on board. A substantial piece of information would be lie down. That's, that's the best way to combat seasickness. And then I also go outside and get a breath of fresh air. That's very important. The anxiety will not help you with seasickness. Be open to the experience. So I said to my wife, anxiety will not help you with seasickness. Be open to the experience. And she said, OK, I'll go. Woohoo! I'm going to Antarctica. And it was the content that Quark Expeditions delivered that got me to Antarctica. The way that we buy has completely changed. It's no longer a selling cycle. Now it's understanding how people buy. It's completely different. So I didn't go with the cheapest, no way. I didn't go with the most famous company. I went with the one that was the most engaged. And it was $20,000 on my American Express card, which was great. I love spending that kind of money because it, it was going to be so much fun. But Quark Expedition said, hey, how would you like to go kayaking in Antarctica? Sign me up. How would you like to go camping in Antarctica? Sign me up for that too. Another $1,000 I spent on my credit card. And here's the thing. Everyone here can achieve this same success if you're engaging with your buyers in the way that we are buying, the way that Quark Expeditions is doing. You can achieve that same success. You're going to see this orange slide pop up a couple of times today. You can achieve that same success. What this is about is real simple. It's about aligning the way you market with the ways that people buy. And so many organizations I've found all over the world, and many of them here in Dubai and in the Gulf region, are out of alignment. They're marketing in one way, and people are buying in another way. We need to get into alignment. That's what we'll be talking about for the next roughly 40 minutes that we have together. There's a picture. We made it. There's the proof. My wife loved the penguins. She loved the penguins so much she wants to go back to Antarctica. We ended up camping here in this penguin colony. I was asleep. My wife stayed awake, and she took pictures of the penguins all night. It doesn't get dark in Antarctica during their summer. I loved the kayaking. Absolutely fabulous. This was a fabulous trip, and we got there because of the Quark Expeditions content. We are now going through a real-time revolution. We're going through a revolution in the ways that people communicate because of the device that we all have in our pocket. The way that people buy, 
using their device, the way that people market and sell using their device. And it's integrated through offline and online, integrating the way we communicate with these devices together with how people work in retail stores and physical places. It's all about a revolution. In your pocket, you have a television studio, a newspaper press room, a radio station, a photo studio. It's all free and it's all in your pocket. But here's the thing. So many organizations are just selling. They're selling and they're selling and they're selling. I just took a couple of screenshots of some emails I got in the last couple of days. I, sw I love to swim. I actually swam in the swimming pool here at the hotel yesterday. It's a great pool. So here's Swim Outlet, three days only sale, 25% off. Here's Speedo, the swimsuits I wear, 40% off. Here's True Religion Jeans, 30% off. This is just like in the last couple of days. Here's Me Undies. It's the kind of underwear I wear. It's weird, I know. I'm showing you my underwear company. 15% off. Oh, I can get socks, 15% off, like my orange socks. And, and the crazy thing about this is that this is how people market online. It's sell this, sale price, free shipping. I don't care. And neither do you. Because when we're ready to buy, we buy on our time. We don't want somebody to sell to us. So I'm going to share with you some ideas for how we can align our marketing with the ways that people buy today. Because so many of us are out of alignment. Four things I'll be talking about, agile marketing, real time, be human, newsjacking a concept I invented, and then finally developing a real-time mindset. And I will talk about Donald Trump, but you have to wait. The first thing is agile marketing, instant engagement. My first job was on a bond trading desk. It looked a little bit like this. It was um, uh, several years ago when I first got out of university. And the whole idea of bond trading is it's instant engagement. What's going on right now? What's going on right this second? And if you knew a piece of data a little bit ahead of people, you could make money trading bonds, sometimes millions of dollars. The same thing is true today with the device in our pockets for every one of our businesses. If we're engaged today, we have the opportunity to make millions of dollars with the device in our pockets. The problem is that most organizations are doing a traditional sales and marketing model. What are they doing? What they're doing is they're gathering data from what worked in the past and planning to do something in the future. What are they going to do next week, next month, or next year? But the problem is if you're only doing things based on next week, next month, and next year, you're not focused on right this second. What's going on right now? What's going on right this second? Because now is when it's happening. You've got to be quick on that shutter, my friend. He's a re we're talking about real time. Okay, there we go. Push the button. <laughs> I'm giving him the perfect shot, and he's like, I can't push the button. It's 5 after 11. What's happening right now? Because now is when things are happening. And if you're engaged in real time, then you have an opportunity to reach people right now. This is the Central Intelligence Agency. Believe it or not, they're totally real time. This is their first tweet. We can neither confirm nor deny this is our first tweet. Love that, don't you? They actually answer questions. Here's a question they answer. No, we don't know your password, so we can't send it to you. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. They're real time, the Central Intelligence Agency. We're going through a real time revolution right now, which brings me to selfies. Selfies and the retail shopping mall industry are completely linked. Why? Because so many people post selfies when they're shopping, when they're eating, when they're at the mall, when they're at the restaurant, when they're doing something with their friends. And so, since I'm with my friends right now, all of you, 
I'm going to do a selfie. Is that cool? Can we, and we, can we all be in my selfie? So if you guys can wave, if you have one of my books, you can hold it up. Ready? Here we go. Oh, that's good. I like that. Okay, here we go. I'm going to put my hand up. You're all in it. Look like you're having fun. Good. Okay, now this is going out on Twitter right this second. And it is now out. It's going out right now. You will find it under our hashtag, which you'll see up there. And also on every one of my slides is my own Twitter ID. So you'll be able to see this selfie as it goes out. So if you're on Twitter, there it is. I'm looking at it right now. If you're, you're on Twitter, please retweet it or, or like it or do something with it if you'd like because it's about selfies. It's about real time. This is my favorite selfie, me and, and former President Bill Clinton, which I love. When people take selfies, they want to share them. When people take selfies in shopping malls, they want to share them. What we're talking about is a real-time mindset, a mindset about instant engagement. I was on an airplane recently, and I met Kobuk. He's a National Humane Rescue, do Rescue Dog, a famous dog. Cool, I took a picture with Kobuk. You gotta do that, right? I said, psyched to meet Kobuk, and I tagged American Airlines, because it was on an American Airlines flight. American Airlines responded to me in less than 15 minutes. Oh, wow, we're sure that was a great moment. Hashtag smile, American Airlines said. I said, that's really cool. And I contacted American Airlines, and they invited me to their headquarters in Dallas to learn about how they do real-time communications. Here's their real-time communications team. They work 24-7. They're always working. These are the social media walls that they have in their headquarters where they monitor what people are saying. They monitor it based on geotags. This is the idea of real-time engagement, what American Airlines is doing. They let me into their integrated operations center. This is this purpose-built building that was made just to house the people that work in the operations center at American Airlines. This is the center of the Integrated Operations Center. Right there on the left-hand side, I'm pointing the arrow to, he's the gentleman who runs the entire airline. He's not the CEO, but he's the one who runs the, the um, operations aspect of the airline. And on the right, there's 2,000 people in this room, roughly. On the right is their social media team their real-time engagement team, because being engaged in real time is that important to American Airlines. It should be that important to you and your business as well. Are you engaged instantly and in real time? This is Dave, he works at a company called Nordstrom. I met Dave at the Burlington Mall in Boston where I shop, and I was looking for shirts. I said, Dave, help me buy some shirts. I bought a couple of shirts from him, and as I was checking out, I gave him my credit card. He says to me, are you on Twitter? I'm like, yeah, I'm on Twitter. Why do you ask? And he goes, I'm on Twitter too. Let's connect on Twitter. Wow, that's really interesting. So I connected with my Nordstrom sales guy on Twitter. And then I was in Bulgaria, Sofia, Bulgar Bulgaria, at a speaking gig, and then I was just waiting around, um, uh, looking on my Twitter feed, I got a direct message from Dave. What does Dave have of, me, have of mine? My Twitter ID, my credit card, my mailing address. He knows what size shirt I like, and he knows what kind of shirt I like. And he says, hey, you interested in this shirt? I said, yes, buy it. <laughs> I bought a shirt for $150 in one second. What Dave and Nordstrom have figured out is how to integrate the shopping mall experience with the way somebody like me who travels all the time buys and is engaged in social media. It's about aligning their marketing with the ways that I buy. Nordstrom, Dave told me, encourages Dave to participate in social media. They paid for his iPad. They paid the ongoing monthly cost of his mobile plan. 
Dave now has moved on to the real estate business. He works for Coldwell Banker in, in Seattle, and he's doing the same thing. He's engaged in social networks to sell real estate. This is his Instagram feed that he talks about real estate. Here's um, one of the, one of the uh, Instagram posts that he made. This is about educating and informing instead of interrupting and selling. All of those companies I shared before, the clothing companies, 25% off, 30% off, they were interrupting and trying to sell to me. Quark Expeditions and Nordstrom and other companies are aligned with how I buy and how all of you buy, and they were educating and informing instead. So I spent a bunch of time a couple of days ago looking at hashtag Mall of the Emirates because I just thought it was really, really interesting to see what people were doing as they were shopping at this mall. And there are 113,000 posts that are tagged hashtag Mall of the Emirates. Now here's what's interesting to me. There were a whole bunch of people who were totally engaged with their shopping experience and with the um, events and the other things that they were doing at the mall. Here's somebody who took a selfie. Selfies again, coming up again and again, this idea of selfies. Here's somebody who took a picture of their photo at the St. Tropez Bistro in Mall of the Emirates. And his, inst this is, these are all Instagram. His Instagram is called Fine Dining Matt. He took this wonderful picture. Now why is it that the chef or somebody from the restaurant didn't get back to him? What a mistake. What a mistake that this guy is posting about food. But it's one way. It's going from him. He's tagging the fact that he's at that restaurant and the restaurant doesn't even respond. It's unbelievably nutty not to do that. Here's somebody else posting a picture of them. Hashtag um, all the Emirates. Here's another one. I, this one is particularly interesting. This person, M underscore Hoyle on Instagram, constantly posting about him uh, wearing interesting clothing, in this case, wearing it at Mall of the Emirates, and fascinating that there were no stores that were engaging with him. What a missed opportunity. I, I took a look at his feed. He has 68,000 followers. Why wouldn't the fashion stores at that mall, or any other mall in Dubai for that matter, connect with him. I just don't understand it. Everyone is so busy selling, nobody is focused on helping people buy. We've got to do a better job at the way that we're engaged with people. This is a pie chart. The entire pie chart is promotion buy my product, buy my product. That's what so many organizations are doing. This is what we should do. This is what Nordstrom does, this is what Quark Expeditions does. 85% of the time, more, way more than half the time, share and engage with people. If somebody posts a photo of, your, of the food at your restaurant, you should say, thanks for stopping by. We're glad you enjoyed the food. If somebody's posting a photograph of the fashion that they wear, hashtagging the mall that they bought it in, the store in that mall that they bought it should be responding. It's about being human. And this is where there's an amazing disconnect around being human. And I want to share with you just one aspect where humanity is lost. And I saw it so many times here in Dubai. I've only been here for three days and I've seen the lack of humanity every day again and again and again. Now here's where it, this is just one idea of the lack of humanity. I want to know Maybe you guys, you're all experts in this industry. So maybe you can help me. Maybe you can help me. Who are these people? Who are these happy, multicultural, 
smiling people that appear in the photographs that you all use. These are stock photos. These aren't real people. These are photographs that you pull out of a catalog. On one hand, you have people on Instagram sharing photos of their life in your mall. On the other hand, the way we're marketing is with fake people. Here's some other of these fake people. Who's this person? This is at a travel, show, a travel store. She's a stock model. I see it in every industry. Here's the, uh, here's the technology industry. They always have happy multicultural sit people sitting around conference rooms. You've seen those photos. How about this one? Happy multicultural people staring into computer screens. You've seen that photo as well. Sometimes I uh, speak in the financial services industry. And for whatever reason, they love this shot. Happy seniors wearing white on vacation, right? This is what they use to represent people who are uh, saving for retirement. Sometimes I speak at healthcare conferences. This is the one that the healthcare conferences use. Creepy doctors with stethoscopes. Do they look like doctors to you? No, they don't look like doctors to me. And then you've got the restaurant and food services business. This is my favorite one. Everybody will, you cannot unsee what I am going to show you now. This is women laughing alone with salad. Did you know how big a thing women laughing alone with salad is? It's everywhere. Here's the thing that's really important. People uh, right now are posting on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter photos of themselves and we're pushing out stock photos. That what happens, this is an IBM's homepage. The same model is on another company's homepage. This is a, a direct mail I received at my house for a company that wants to be my dentist. I don't want to be your, your, I don't want you to be my dentist if you're using these weird people in your marketing. And I'm just talking about this one aspect of humanity. It's really, really important. So I want you to say no to stock photography. Ramesh, would you come up, please? Uh, give a hand to a real photographer. So here we have a real photographer. When you want to have pictures on your website, pictures in your advertising, pictures in your marketing, pictures at your stores or in your uh, companies, I want you to use a real photographer. Should we take a couple pictures? Yeah, sure. This is the perfect spot for photos right here. See? Look at that. And then we'll get one with me. How about that? You probably have a, your lens is probably too long, but can you get me and everyone in the background? No, that's okay. That's okay. One more round of applause for Ramesh. A real photographer, say no to stock photos. So the next concept is what I call newsjacking. Newsjacking is the art and science of injecting your ideas into a breaking news story. Every breaking news story breaks like this. The news story breaks, it gains in interest, at some point it peaks, and then it trails off. Your job, if you want to newsjack is in real time to create a real time blog post, a, a video, a tweet with a hashtag at the moment that that story is really popular. So for example, in the business to business world, a company called Oracle acquired market to lead and the CEO of the competing company the competing company was called Eloqua. They're a marketing software company. They saw this acquisition announcement. And when they did a Google search, there was only one listing for this acquisition. So what an opportunity the CEO of the competing company had. And they wrote a blog post in real time. And it, and it was called Oracle Joins the Party and it simply provided context to that acquisition. Now, what do the journalists have? They have this three-sentence announcement that Oracle made, 
And now they also have this great blog post that was written by the CEO of the competition. So that meant that every news story that came out had a quote from the CEO of the competition. Here's Bloomberg Businessweek quoting Joe Payne from the Eloqua, the competition. Here's Customer Think, an important blog, also quoting Joe Payne. Here's PC World quoting the CEO of the competitor. Here's another one, Information World, again quoting Joe Payne. So what's interesting here is that when you're quick and you put content into the market when the moment is right, you have an opportunity to generate interest in the media and with your customers because then they sent a link to that blog post to everybody in their database. They sent a link to that blog post through their LinkedIn, through their Twitter, and through other social networks. And that generated a million dollars worth of new business. And you can imagine in your own business, what might be a news story that would be something that you could comment on? In this case, it was just their competition was acquired. But there's always these opportunities for these news stories. So then, just a couple of years, about a year later, Oracle also bought Eloqua. It was an $810 million deal. So this blog post, one blog post, generated $16 million for Eloqua. One blog post. And there's no question you can achieve the similar results. Why? Because Joe Payne from Eloqua was in a room just like this. It happened to be in London. He learned the ideas that I'm sharing with you right now. And then the moment was right. He did some newsjacking and he made $16 million. So it's about understanding that news cycle and being ready when the moment is right. I was honored at the end of last year when the Oxford English Dictionary named newsjacking to the dictionary and they said in, a few, in the space of a few short years, newsjacking has gone from an experimental technique to a staple in every social media savvy marketing department's arsenal. Its contemporary iteration uh, dates from the early 21st century as first popularized by marketing and sales strategist David Meerman Scott. So that was really cool. But I'm saying that only because this has become such an important strategy that it's actually in the Oxford English Dictionary. Here's how newsjacking works. When there's news stories that break, you need to know about them quickly. So you use your mobile device or you use a video or you use your computer and you look at the news. I look at Google News, but there's many other sources. I also pay attention to what's trending on Twitter. I also read a daily newspaper. And then this device in my pocket becomes the way I newsjack. I might send a tweet with a hashtag. I might send um, uh, a video out. And I'm pushing out my content when the moment is right. Because the decisive advantage is speed. The decisive advantage is when you're ready and the time is right, that is when you send something out. Here's one more example of this idea of newsjacking. So a couple of months ago, it was announced um, that Megan was expecting a, a, a royal baby. Oh, that's interesting. Um, the um, uh, Prince Harry and his wife are going to have a baby. How interesting. And the news was everywhere. So it might be an opportunity for newsjacking. Here are a couple that I found were very clever. Uh, here's a company that's found in many um, shopping malls in Europe, H&M. Harry and Megan, H&M, isn't that cute, right? So they said spring 2019, royal, hashtag royal baby. So that's kind of cool. Um, this is Iceland Foods. We personally can't wait to welcome this little ginger wonder into our lives, royal, hashtag royal baby. Okay, that's cool. You sell carrots and you can tie it to the royal baby. That's pretty interesting. This is my favorite the Yorkshire Wildlife Park. So when a new royal baby is announced, it trends nationally in the UK, but when we announce our new baby warty piglets, the news doesn't even travel as far as Rotterdam. Favoritism, period. And then the picture of the cute little warty uh, piglets. But it got tons of attention. 
Because when the moment is right, that's when you push out the content. So what this all means is, in order to align your marketing with the ways that people buy, you need to be focused on real time. You need to be focused on humanity. When people are out there engaging, you should be connecting with them at that moment rather than trying to sell to them at another moment. When people are focused on putting cool photographs of themselves out on Instagram as they're shopping, that's when you connect with them, not when you're having your sale price. And that idea of connection is really, really important. I think of it as a mindset shift. The idea of changing your mind about what's important and what's interesting. Changing your mind about how to engage. It's the same kind of mindset shift that's required to, to do an exercise program. And that's something that I know about. On the left there is a picture of me around my 50th birthday. I'm 57 now. I weighed 212 pounds then. I weighed 157 pounds now. Could we have the camera on me, guys? Is that possible to put the camera on me for just a second? Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do is demonstrate something. I used to not be able to do any pull-ups. It's too hard. Today, down in the morning at the... Um, the hotel, um, uh, the hotel gym, I did 60 pull-ups. Not all in a row, I did six sets of 10. I used to be able to do no pull-ups. Here's the photo, Ramesh. Photo's coming up. I used to be able to do no push-ups. Now I can do what are called plyometric push-ups. You get your whole body off the ground. I'll do three. One, two, three. And thank you. Now, the reason I'm doing that is really simple. I needed to make a mindset shift about how to get fit and healthy and get strong and have a good body. And that same mindset shift is what you need to do to connect with buyers when they're looking for what you have to offer. I call it your marketing fitness. Which brings me, I promised I would talk about Donald Trump, which brings me to Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the president of my country and he believes the president of the world <laughs> because he does exactly what I just told you about. Donald Trump is a real-time marketer. Donald Trump was elected president of the United States because he does real-time marketing, because he's engaged with his buyers, his voters, and because he does newsjacking. I first started to do my analysis of the US presiden presidential election back in 2015, 18 months before the presidential election of November 2016. So here's some of the gear I collected when I went to the events. I went to many different events, physical events, to analyze how these candidates do their marketing. I went to two, three Hillary Clinton events. I went, I waited in line for two hours to t be in the front row at this Hillary Clinton event so I could take this awesome photograph. I went to two Donald Trump events. I waited in line for two hours so I could be at the front row of Donald Trump's event and I took this awesome photo. I'm so into it and I analyzed for hours, how are these candidates connecting? Now, this is important. I don't do this presentation in, in, the, in the United States anymore because people get too angry when I talk about Donald Trump. Um, but I figure I can do it here. And I need to say, though, this is not a political discussion. I'm not talking about Donald Trump's politics. I'm talking about Donald Trump's marketing. Donald Trump is president because he marketed using the tools I just talked about. That's why Donald Trump is president. Here's the first time I predicted he would be president, August of 2015, 18 months before the election. I said Donald Trump is winning the social networking primaries by a landslide. People laughed at me. They said there's no way that guy will win. What are you talking about? You're crazy. He's terrible. I said, wait a minute. He's the best marketer. 
Here's the proof, I said. On the left is the amount of money that the candidates spent in advertising. On the top, Jeb Bush, George W. Bush's brother, spent $82 million in 2015. On the right is the free media attention that they generated by doing real-time connection news jacking so and social media. Donald Trump generated $2 billion in free attention. $2 billion, more than all the other candidates put together in the year 2015. I wrote about Donald Trump a bunch of other times. Here's another blog post I wrote, March 2, 2016. Donald Trump, the real-time marketing master that the pundits dismissed. I called him a real-time marketing master back in 2016, March, six months before the election. People said, David, you're crazy. This guy will never win. What are you talking about? Um, I don't know if you know who Tony Robbins is. He is a, a, a great um, American speaker. And I, I did a video with Tony Robbins. He and I talked about Donald Trump and his election uh, coming up and his marketing techniques. People said, David, you're crazy. What are you talking about? And I provided examples. Here's an example of Donald Trump newsjacking. Hillary Clinton was giving the most important speech of her life at the Democratic National Convention. This was her entire life led up to this moment. This was the biggest speech she would ever, ever deliver. And Donald Trump was newsjacking it. What was he doing? He was sitting at home in Trump Tower, live tweeting as Hillary Clinton was delivering her speech. No one had ever done that before. No one had ever engaged in that way before. Here's what Donald Trump said. Hillary will never reform Wall Street. She's owned by Wall Street. Our way of life is under threat by radical Islam and Hillary Clinton cannot even bring herself to say the words. Now the reason that's interesting is because this meant that every one of these tweets was meant that Donald Trump was quoted in the stories about Hillary Clinton. I don't agree with what Donald Trump does, and I don't agree with how Donald Trump does this as a president, but Donald Trump is the president because he was the only candidate that was aligned in this way. He generated $5 billion in free media. When Donald Trump finally was elected, I jumped in with a blog post, the best marketer has been elected president. Everyone else was like, how did this guy win? And I said, I've been talking about this for a year and a half. And then finally people started to listen to me. So I got quoted in a whole bunch of news stories. Here's Forbes ma magazine. I was quoted in the front um, article, uh, the, the front paragraph of that. Here's another story I was quoted in marketing magazine quoting me. Here's two quotes from Donald Trump. Social media has more power than the money that the other candidates spent. I'll repeat it. Social media has more power than the money that the other candidates spent. Let me rephrase that. Social media has more power than the money that your competitors are spending. Here's another quote. Twitter is who I am, Donald Trump says. This is how I communicate. It's the reason I got elected. It's the reason I'm successful. So it doesn't have to be Twitter, but this is how you can be successful too. The time is now. And finally, we need to overcome our fear of this kind of marketing. Remember I told you about my wife was scared of crossing the Drake Passage? She overcame her fear and went with me. I also needed to overcome my fear because I wanted to jump into the water. I told you I'm a swimmer. I went swimming here in the swimming pool yesterday. I wanted to go swimming in Antarctica. So I said to the people on the ship, can I jump in? They said, sure, okay. They have rules, here are the rules. They have to put a rope around my waist. I said, what's the rope for? In case your heart stops, we can reel you in, they said. All right, put on the rope. Here's the other rule. We're gonna have the ship's doctor waiting right here. So I said, okay, cool, I'm good. I jumped in to the water and I figure as long as I'm going to jump in, I might as well do a cannonball. And then I wanted to swim and touch an iceberg. 
but I forgot about the rope, so I wasn't able to touch the iceberg. But I overcame my fear of jumping into the water. And that's the same thing you need to do, is overcome your fear of a new kind of marketing. I'm David Meerman Scott, and this has been a new marketing model. Thanks very much, everyone. I'll be here for the rest of the day. Thanks so much. All right, our next panel discussion is on how to make cinema in the shopping centers regionally work. This session brings together prominent industry speakers to discuss the current issues, challenges, trends, and how malls gear up for big screens and entertainment in the future. So our moderator for the session has been waiting very patiently here with us, Vic Begaria. He's an entrepreneur and chief visionary officer at Expand Retail, powered by Savant. He's a very passionate person about helping brands establish strategies to sustain loyal consumer clientele and has a proven talent for blending sales techniques with insights into clients' needs and expectations. Let's please welcome him with a big round of applause. You can sit anywhere you like. All right. In no particular order, our esteemed panelists, we've got Cameron Mitchell, and he's the Chief Executive Officer of Majid al Futaim Cinemas, the owner and the operator of Vox Cinema Brands, the Middle East largest cinema exhibitor. Let's please welcome Cameron. <laughs> our next panelist is John Davis, and John has over 25 years of property-related experience and joined Colors International in 1994 from one of South Africa's leading financial institutions as general manager, finance for the company's property management division. Big round of applause to John. And now let's all welcome Mazen Kondil. He is currently the executive director of Granada Investment Center Organization which manages the very well-known Granada complex in Raida City. Granada Center and Granada Business Park are the major two components in this complex. Last but not least, let's welcome Hashish Shukla. He is the CEO of Sinopolis Gulf. In his role, Hashish is responsible for adapting Sinopolis International best practices in cinemas under the banner of Sinopolis Gulf which will commence in operation in the UAE, Bahrain, Oman, and Saudi Arabia region in 2019. Big round of applause to our moderator and our panelists. Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear us? I guess so. Welcome to Recon uh, Middle East, North Africa. So this panel is about uh, how to make cinema and shopping center regionally work. I think we're doing a tremendous uh, job at it, aren't we? Uh, reflecting back in my growing up years in Dubai, back in the 70s, um, oh, looks like I give my age out here. <laughs> Things actually started changing in the 70s when the National Cinema and Jumeirah Cinema were demolished. Uh, names like Deira Cinema, Dubai Cinema, Al Nasser, Tran, Plaza Cinema became very, very popular. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Dera Cinema was the first air-conditioned cinema uh, that we in this region had. Uh, so one of my founders uh, movie going experience back in the days was our uh, trips to Rex Drive-In Cinema located in Al Khwanij Road. Uh, very, very popular among families they will walk in with a basket of, uh, you know, picnic basket uh, with mats. Kids were allowed to play while the parents are watching movie, sitting on the mat, uh, and in, or in the car with the with the piped in AC. Wow! So those are the nostalgic cinema experience from back in the days. Well, back to now, we have uh, in our panel some accomplished uh, industry, uh, you know, contributors which uh, we will discuss about their insights on how we've gotten so far and what are we doing to, uh, to go to the next level. So 
welcome everyone. It was very, very nice meeting you all. Uh, so I've got a few questions. However, uh, we'll open up the floor after we're done with our, with our discussion. Please feel free to write down and let us know if you have any questions. So to start with, can I, uh, can, can I start with you on what are the two most important changes that you've seen from my growing up years to now? So I think um, um, probably the big difference from a Majid Alpha Tame perspective is the focus on, first of all, the experience and the customer. Um, our product's very generic. Everyone shows exactly the same film on exactly the same day. So I think um, our big differentiating factor is the fact that we're so focused on what it is that our customers want and, and the experience of going to a cinema. If you remember back to the example you just mentioned about cinemas gone by, it's still at that stage in many countries where you go in and you have generic blue boxes with a um, you know, projector. Um, we're really focused on making sure the experience every time is different from you know, the food to the service to the ambiance to what a child experiences to what we experience to the VIP experience. So I think that, and again, focusing on what it is the customer wants. Um, Majid Alpha Tame has a huge focus on NPS and on daily feedback from our customers and ensuring that we adjust the cinema experience based on what they're looking for. That's the big differentiator in the Middle East. And I think the, the cinemas are here are significantly better than the rest of the world, um, particularly the US, which is a 100-year-old industry. Um, our business you know, was um, founded in 1999, the cinema business. We've grown seven times in the last five years and we'll grow four times in the next five years. Um, on the back of, again, always reinventing and always focusing on the experience and the customer. Wow, so customers are king. Always. And they're changing very, very constantly. Every day. Yeah. Ashish, in your experience, uh, obviously you have a huge India experience as well as the globally. What do you think has, has changed? Well, if you would like to add some more points. So must uh, compliment uh, what Cameron was talking about. Uh, Vox has done a good job. Uh, as far as the market is concerned. Uh, we at Cinepolis, uh, we come in from the core of the organization has been something that the family started about 70 years back and has grown into 19 countries uh, now as far as operations is concerned. And uh, in terms of productivity, we are the number one operator uh, as far as the global footprint is concerned. So there have been immense learning and immense uh, amount of uh, if I can say, innovation that the company has done over the last uh, decades of business that we've been into. Uh, especially the kind of formats that uh, we see here are very good. Uh, at the same time, there are more formats that uh, we continue to innovate upon and introduce. So that is something that we'll be bringing to the region and that's what uh, we are. In. I mean, just to say we are in the movie business, uh, but, but the core is still F&B. So that's what uh, we happen to show movies, uh, but the business is F&B. I'm happy to watch it, one mm -hmm. of my favorites. So I'm sure we all are putting in a lot of considerable effort within our own organizations to see how we are coping with the changes. Uh, John, would you uh, be able to uh, give us some insights on what touch points uh, do you look into managing, managing your clients? Thank you very much. I, th I think if, as Cameron said, the movie industry is 100 and, I think it's 123 years old this year. It started in December uh, 1895. And what we had back in, or what, what they had back in uh, the early days, and what you've got now is, is, is pretty much uh, the same. It's a box where you go, you want to be entertained, uh, and you, you come away with an experience. And if you think the films that they've made over the years, they're action films, they're romantic films, they're sci-fi films, and not very much uh, has, has changed. What has happened, though, is that the technology has moved dramatically. So when we're talking to developers now, we're not talking about how many projection rooms they need or how many seats they need. It's a case of what is going to work uh, f from them. I can remember having a discussion many, many years ago with a cinema operator who said, um, we, we've got a new concept where we're going to have a, uh, a single projection room and we'll have one projectionist and he will operate a computer and switch on the various, uh, switch on the various films. It was actually a 12 screen multiplex that we were looking at and we went, you don't want a projection room. No, I don't want a projection room. And it, it, it was a shift. And I think the next shift that we're going to see and what we're having, discussions that we're having with uh, developers now is the next phase of technology within the cinema industry because the projection room has gone. It's going to disappear. You, the, the, the screen area that you've got, that is going to change dramatically. Uh, we were having a discussion earlier that uh, Dolby Atmos and Samsung are now coming out with technology where you will have a screen which is 50 square meters 
it will use far less uh, electricity, it will consist of 96 panels, and if something happens with the panel, you'll change the panel. You don't need the projection room because it's backlit by, by lasers. So the, the traditional movie theater, as we know it today, is going to change. Will movies still be around in 50 years' time? I'm sure they will be. They'll probably be just in a different, uh, in a different format. Wow. So I still go to cinemas, and I still feel that I love the traditional cinema experience, and I see that that's changing a lot with technology. It's interesting mm -hmm. to see that. Uh, Martin, uh, you're in an exciting country right now with, uh, with introducing cinema after so many years. So uh, as a part of country's uh, 2030 vision, the government target is to have 300 cinema houses, correct? Yeah. Uh, and say about 2,000 screens is yeah. the number I've kind of sort of researched out. What cha uh, changes have you faced? Or what challenges have you fa faced or witnessed in introducing the cinemas? Yeah, the challenge is for um, in, in, into three scenarios. Those uh, landlords with the operated mall already to find the way and solution how to absorb the uh, cinema box. And those uh, where they are lucky like us of having uh, expansion currently that we can uh, change and uh, create a box for, uh, for such uh, uh, an anchor. And those for coming development where they're taking the advantage to design it in, uh, in, in the best way. For us as a landlord, it's a new learning for us. We need to be humble, we need to be listened for great operators uh, to get the lessons from them. It's, uh, it's a new anchor, but it's a very important anchor uh, as an entertainment within the malls. And it's a lot to be learned uh, for the coming years. Well, it's an exciting time ahead, I'm sure. How is, how is the cinemas uh, operating now? Have you seen a positive, uh, a for positive approach on accepting it? It's amazing positive, and I think Cameron can tap on that for uh, the occupancy rate, uh, definitely due to uh, less supply currently, but the, the appealing and, uh, and the social impact of that new uh, anchor within the malls, it gets very positive feedback. Yeah. Nice, all the best. Uh, Cameron, if I may ask you, you have uh, several works locations across the GC. So how do you cater to ever-evolving customer behavior in each uh, works cinema complex throughout the GCC? Mm. This year um, in cinema, we've, as I said, we, we first opened in 1999. This year we'll serve our 100 millionth guest in the Middle East. So um, we are very established as, as Majid Al Fatim Cinemas. Um, every cinema is looked at differently. It's always tailored to the development, to the landlord, and, and what's the catchment and what's the competition to ensure that even down to the programming, the food and beverage, the service is different on a on a case by case basis. Um, if you look at you know our expansion into Saudi Arabia, um, we've announced a, a six hundred million dollar in investment into cinemas in, in Saudi, of which we'll de deploy at least a hundred screens next year. So we're moving very quickly in Saudi Arabia, but we're talking to our Saudi visitors. We've We've got the only multiplex in the country at the moment about what it is that they want, what it is they expect. We're working closely with our landlords to ensure that we have a really good understanding of the catchment around that specific mall, and we're tailoring the cinema design to that mall and that catchment. So again, every cinema is looked at individually to ensure that we're not generic in any way. Um, we're not like McDonald's where we have a consistent product. The product will evolve and change. So, you know, we have a, a VIP brand, Theatre by Rose, in partnership with Gary Rose, who's a Michelin-starred chef. We won't put that everywhere because the price point won't be attractive to some customers. Um, be it, you know, our, our 40X brand or our kids brand, every, every cinema is looked at differently and uniquely to ensure that we offer what the customer is looking for. Nice. And uh, in, in introducing new technologies uh, from buying a ticket off the counter to being able mm. to purchase it online, uh, having, uh, you know, being able to buy and get the food delivered to your mm. seat. So can you just touch base on how you've sort of looked into different technologies to see how uh, that's going to help evolve the customer experience? Sure. So at the moment, half of our tickets are sold online in advance. Um, we've just recently launched a, a food and beverage app, which allows you also to buy food and beverage in advance before you watch a film. Um, we have our food and beverage delivered into our VIP cinemas as well. Um, from a technology perspective, we're always looking and again, talking to the customer about what they want. We did some research recently and one customer came back really firmly and said, don't take away the cues because when I'm in the cinema, I'm not allowed to talk and that, I, I like the social side of queuing up and deciding in the impulse part of the purchase. So imagine that for time, we're gonna do both. We're gonna have you know, the, the best 
um, online e-commerce systems as well as the traditional systems, and we'll let the customer choose how they want to interact with us. Um, you know, we have now you know more than a million followers in the Middle East through our, our social platform, and we're always updating that uh, frequently to ensure that we're again offering what the customer wants in each specific catchment. Oh, interesting. So the customers uh, want the traditional way of serving the concessions as well as online. Yeah. Uh, in my experience, I think uh, it, we are catering to two different generations here. Mm. I would still go queue up, look at what I mm. feel like having at that time. It's not only the popcorns and chips mm. and cokes anymore. Mm. It's also add add on uh, a, a big menu right now. So it's 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 an impulsive buy for us. It, it could be quite arrogant to um, implement something without sort of engaging with the customer by again offering one option and not the other. So for us, we're offering both, and we're letting the customers decide. And again, we're seeing a great uptake on uh, digital and online, but we're also seeing some who like to interact and like to do the, the personalised experience at the counter and involve the impulse. So again, the, the customer always decides. Perfect, perfect. Uh, Ashish, uh, you are entering the, the 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 region now. What are, what are your plans in terms of your number of screens and cinemas? So we are uh, currently. We've contracted 100 plus screens in the non-KSA region. We've also, which is, uh, we will be op uh, getting operational in Bahrain uh, by early 19. We would be entering Oman and UAE. So these are the three uh, countries outside that we are currently uh, working with. And in KSA, we got our license. We've partnered with uh, Alocare, and our regional partner is Altair. So we've uh, kind of moving uh, well in terms of the regional investment, we are looking at about 500 million US uh, across uh, the region, and that's what uh, we are working towards. Wow. So what new experience can we expect from, uh, from uh, to be delivered with the new cinema? Sure. So I think uh, I I've studied cinemas, and I've been part of uh, this business for the last about, uh, about 20 plus years. And uh, what I've seen in the region Sometimes I've seen that these cinemas have been force-fitted into boxes which were not meant to be cinemas. And that really compromises the kind of screen that is, uh, that is there, the kind of experience that uh, we call them fetus auditoriums or we call them, uh, you know, uh, if I could say stamp size screens sometimes. And I, I might as well do them at my home. So uh, there is a minimum uh, criteria that, that Cinepolis follows. And uh, quite often, if it's not a Cinepolis design, we walk out of the project. So, uh, and, and this fraternity is largely of developers. What we've seen in, in, in the global footprint is that uh, the developers who are organized, uh, they kind of lock in the big anchors uh, before the piling is started. Now, if that is done, uh, it makes a lot of difference. It, is, it makes a lot of difference in the design uh, as to what the final experience will be. Uh, and of course, uh, in terms of the differentiators, it is, it's a constant journey. Uh, we, we pioneered the concept of, uh, of luxury cinemas, which is, uh, which is the VIP, which is what we call it, Cinepolis VIP. And uh, food, again, happens to be a very integral part of the experience. We've recently won the award for our junior cinema concept, which was about three years back. We introduced junior cinemas about uh, eight years back in Mexico. And now we are rolling it out across, uh, you know, the globe as well. It is, uh, it is something that, we, that is really, uh, you know, a pleasure for kids and families and young parents uh, to come in. Uh, and many more formats that we've introduced as well. So, I mean, there, there would be something, some, uh, quite a few things new which uh, the industry would be able to see once we open up. Wow. That's great. Uh, let's move to, to uh, KSA. Uh, so, Martin, how important is uh, the Saudi market for the introduction of cinema after 35 years absent in the market, and why? Of course, it's amazing and, and, and very important uh, anchor. It complements the, uh, the entertainment offering uh, within the development, uh, and it's create a footfall, especially with these uh, down times. Uh, but we really need to be careful uh, as a landlord and, uh, and developer where to put it and how to put it. And not to, uh, although there is a huge demand now for spaces from operators, but we really uh, don't need to look and be greedy about the numbers rather than looking for a best uh, beyond the leasing uh, deal uh, with the best operation, with the best marketing. 
and best distributor who can really uh, create a landmark for uh, for uh, for the developer or for the uh, for the shopping center. So it's it's right. It's an important and it's it was very sus long time suspended uh, option uh, of entertainment. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, local content that was available uh, in the YouTube, and now we'll find the channel uh, to go over for a massive uh, audience. So, uh, going back to Ashish, uh, we have historically heard about how uh, cassettes and videotapes, DVD streaming videos like Netflix, uh, will see the destruction in cinema industry. But cinema are still relevant as solid addition to the entertainment option in shopping centers. Why do you think that's the phenomenon? I know you and me spoke about it on the phone, and you had a very interesting outlook on that. If you could share that with us. Sure. So, I mean, as on the panel itself right now, if you look at it, we are talking about a thousand million to be invested uh, into the region, into cinemas. Uh, it it like wouldn't be happening. 3.54 billion US dollars from now to 2030. So that's that's the number I've reached out to. Yeah, that's the PwC report. Uh, but having said that, uh, this investment is coming in primarily because uh, we we don't see uh, the impact to be uh, something. And just to share data, uh, we 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 are part of the GCF, the Global Cinema Federation, and uh, there was a study done uh, beginning of this year, which was announced in CinemaCon. Uh, it is uh, basically the theatrical business uh, was compared. Uh, 12 years back to this, uh, to the last year, and uh, what is the impact of uh, the so-called uh, home video, various channels which have opened up, it could be Netflixes and, and all this. Uh, so 42% uh, was the contribution which was there uh, 12 years back from theatrical for all the movie business, uh, which continues, the pie has grown much larger in the 12 years, but the percentage contribution continues to be the same. So it is still 42%. So that is a substantial uh, explanation of uh, that the, the man is a social animal and, and wants to be seen with people. And the big screen experience is something which, which is not easily replicatable and only very few can really replicate that at their homes. Uh, so those are things that we believe that uh, is the future uh, and, and theaters and cinemas are here to stay. We, I mean, 20 years back, uh, or I've, I've felt this uh, question, or I've faced this question when the VCRs came in. I've faced this question when uh, the Blu-rays came in, when the DVDs came in, and similar is the Netflix. I mean, it's never provided the, the operators and developers continue to develop destination developments, larger than life experiences, which are not replicatable. I, I don't see... Uh, you know, a, a real challenge uh, as far as theatrical is concerned. Yeah. To be Can honest, uh, on to tab on that, it's the same argument that we are having for the last 20 years, e-commerce versus shopping centers. So uh, the experience is, is, is the key element where, where the people will spend their money. So uh, I agree absolutely with, the, with Ashish. It's all about the experience. It's all about the offering. It's all about the right location. Totally agree. It's more therapeutical than uh, recreational now, according to yeah. some research. Would you would like to add anything? Yeah, I, th I think um, uh, more than ever, food and entertainment are going to anchor every shopping mall. Shopping malls are going to get smaller, and entertainment and food is going to become more important. You know, as, as I mentioned, um, Majid Al Fatahim's announced a um, six hundred million dollar investment into cinemas in Saudi. Um, we're investing in a big team of Sa Saudi Arabian nationals today that are going to uh, run that business for us. Um, next year we'll open 100 screens. So um, I think absolutely within 10 years it'll be a billion dollar market, which puts it in the top 10 markets in the world. Um, it'll be at least double the, the Middle East that exists today, the cinema market. Um, we expect our, our um, market share to be in the vicinity of 50 to 60% of that, given we are moving really quickly and investing in you know, um, cinemas that are as good if not better than the cinemas that exist worldwide today. So I think there is a bit of a race for space at the moment, but I think those that will be most successful, again, those that are focused on the customer experience, as Majid Al Fatame does, those that invest in the right type of cinema, because the standard argument we always have with landlords is we can pay a bit more rent, but it's going to come out of the fit-out cost. So if you look at uh, you know, the trade-off, would you rather have a really strong anchor that's really attractive to your customer 
or would you rather have a, a tenant that pays 10% more rent to build something that is not going to attract people to your shopping mall? Um, so for us, it's about you know, moving quickly, building exceptional cinemas, um, ensuring that every cinema is tailored to the catchment, to the, to the market, and ensuring that we're a, a really strong and attractive um, tenant and anchor to the shopping mall. You mentioned uh, the cinema in the rest of the world, like looking at the West, has not as evolved as mm. uh, we are in the region. And it used to be the other way around a few years back. What, mm. Why do you see that slow adaptation there and where are we heading towards mm. India? Uh, I think we have some, obviously, that there are some advantages to operating in the Middle East. But I also think, look at everything that the Middle East does. Look at, look at Mall of the Emirates. When Mall of the Emirates was built, um, and still today, it's, you know, if not the best shopping, shopping center in the world, it's one of the best, um, with a, a, a ski slope. And at that time, um, as I understand it, I wasn't around, but people were questioning, why would you build a shopping mall of that size? Why would you build a ski slope? Yet now, every mall in the Middle East is shaped around Mall of the Emirates, about right. creating a great experience, about investing in the right type of fit out and incentivizing tenants and bringing the right tenants to make a, a greater and a more attractive whole. So, um, I think Dubai in general, the Middle East in general, is very focused on the experience and what they do. As I said, they, there are some um, artificial advantages that the region has, but um, I feel, you know, particularly in the US, cinema has, is declining and it's just not attractive. It's not an attractive anchor anymore. And again, if, if it's just a box with a movie in it, you can do that at home. Yeah. But if it's a great experience, if it's great F&B, if it's great service, it's a great place to go and hang out with the family, then it's not about going and watching a movie, it's about going and having a great experience. And again, that's Majid Al-Fatame, um, our owner's vision, which um, we talk about a lot, is to create great moments for everyone every day. Not, not to make more money, that, of course we want to do that, it's about making sure that it's an exceptional experience. Right. I mean, uh, can, can, can we maybe just touch on the disruptors? Sure. In, 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 in the industry, because I think that, that's something that we, we tend to forget about. We all look at the movie industry and you've got these blockbusters coming out, but what about the disruptors? What about the Amazons? What about the Netflix of this world? As you know, Netflix have been kicked out of Cannes because they've been told by the French, bless the French, that unless the, uh, the film has uh, launched in France, it's not eligible to be at the Cannes Film Festival. So the film industry is feeling a little bit threatened by the Netflix uh, and the Amazons of, of this world. And I think uh, if, you, if you have a look, I think uh, Netflix have bought something like 40 cinemas in the US, which they're, they're about to open. Um, and also, they're looking around the world at what they call a collective viewing. So if you want to go and watch a box set with some friends, a sim similar entity that you would do with karaoke, you get your friends together, you go and hire a booth, you take your box set, and you sit there and you have your pizza and you have, a, you have an experience. So the, the, the movie industry, I think, is, is a lot wider than we actually see here, here in the Middle East. And the, the disruptors are going to, to take their slice of it. And if Netflix can be powerful and they can maybe start having their own um, Cannes Film Festival uh, somewhere else in the world, uh, you might see some of the big money, and obviously there's not a lot of money going into Netflix films at the moment, but you might see some of that big money uh, starting to move across. Uh, and if you take film producers as well, you've got film producers now and directors who are shooting with mobile phones because the technology is so good. So if you can start to make it cheaper, I think we discussed earlier, about making a, a movie at Bollywood, how cheap it can be, how quick it can be, and how quickly you can get it to market. So I think we need to look uh, at the disruptors and keep an eye on them as well. Right. Well, Bollywood is a very unique example, churning out 600 mm. movies in a year, and uh, it looks like they all are doing well right now, but you know, mm. I think Ashish can explain more on that. However, w w what do you, uh, where are you guys thinking about, uh, in terms of experience, uh, VR, uh, do you think that could play an important part within a part of a cinema experience or a home experience? But uh, I've read somewhere that we are, the, there will be movies made specifically for having their experiences on virtual reality. VR, Vic, is, is, is struggling. And the reason that VR is struggling, that if you go into a cinema and you put on a VR goggles, the producer, when you go, and the, the, the movie uh, director, when you... Film, when he films a movie, he has got certain shots that he wants you to look at. So the action shots or whatever's happening. When you're in a VR theater, the major action can be going over here, but you can sit and look over here and you're actually going to, to lose it. At the moment, they're doing a VR of the moon landing, which will be released uh, for the 60th moon, uh, 50th moon landing 
which is next year. And the, the only problem that they have, and it's been uh, launched apparently at a cinema in Amsterdam, where each seat, uh, there'll be one seat and you'll have a 360 degree rotation. And the problem they have is that people might be looking around, looking at the other planets, instead of looking at the actual uh, moon landing. So, and also the nausea that, that comes with uh, VR as well. That's a, that's a problem that they, that they have to overcome. So I don't think we're going to see VR in one of the Emirates uh, in, in, in the distant future. Mm. I uh, beg to differ. You will see uh, VR, but I, I agree at, at MOE uh, next year. But the industry is yet to evolve properly. I think um, cinemas is a shared experience. Um, sitting in a room by yourself having a cup of coffee is not the same as sitting in a cafe with your friends and enjoying a, a shared experience. So I think VR is evolving quickly. Majid Al Fatame invested in a company by the name of Dreamscape based out of LA who has a shared VR experience. So you can be in the VR world with your friends, which is really quite a unique take on it. Um, I think as that evolves, I think it'll be a really interesting space to watch because at the moment, no one's making money out of VR, but it is an interesting space. It's a space to watch out for. I think so. Yeah. Uh, so that brings us to a question on what do you see is in store globally for cinema? Never mind this. So I think, again, um, you know, obviously there's, there's a lot of consolidation happening at the moment. You know, Disney have bought 20th Century Fox has, has been a, a really interesting sort of transaction. Disney is very focused on cinemas and having multiple windows, so I think that's really good for the industry. Um, I think there's going to be, you know, the worldwide box office at the moment is about $40 billion. Um, it's, it's flatlining in some countries. It's quite, um, it's, they're not seeing a lot of growth. I think Asia and the Middle East, there's still a lot of growth. Um, Saudi Arabia, there's going to be significant growth in the next few years to at least a billion dollars, we think, within 10. Um, so I think more focus on the experience. There'll still be a lot of content. I think content will evolve. I think the technology will continue to evolve, things like the, the Samsung screen, and, and I think the technology will continue to get better, which is great news for developers and great news for cinemas because it's a reason to still continue to come to the cinema. Um, because, again, as the technology evolves and... You know, like we embrace a lot of alternate content, so you can come and watch the wrestling at our cinemas, concerts at our cinemas. Um, I think that will be really interesting for people, like the, the wrestling's at 3 a.m. in the morning, and we can get four or 5,000 people come and watch the wrestling in a shopping mall. So I think extending that will be um, interesting over time. Yeah. John, your inputs on this? I, I think, um, as Cameron said, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to evolve, and technology is going to play a huge part of it, as technology has done going back to 100 and 23 years. The, the other uh, thing that we haven't um, talked about is holograms. Yes. You know, uh, live live bands. You take Queen. You can now have Freddie Mercury as a hologram. Uh, you have got Amy Winehouse who does a show with a hologram. Michael so Jackson. you know, maybe maybe the future is, is more interactive uh, as we go forward. As, as Cameron and the others said, it's a collective. The millennials they want to go out with their friends. They don't want to do something in isolation. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be short and sharp because we know the, uh, the attention span um, is, uh, is shorter. Sure, sure. Mazen, your inputs on this? Yeah, no, nothing yeah. that part is the technology part <laughs> and the cinema provider. Ashish, you got to add? I think uh, to add to what we were talking about VR, I think uh, VR definitely uh, will come into the cinemas. A uh, lot of operators have been trying out various formats in which form as either what John was talking about or what something that Cameron was talking about. Uh, I believe that the format is still evolving. Future of cinemas, to answer your question, I believe uh, it is, it's fast, uh, if I can say, changing. Uh, right from the celluloid projectors, now we are into uh, LED screens. Uh, and it is, technology is moving very fast. Uh, sound is changing. Uh, you know, equally rapidly, and uh, in terms of uh, content delivery is changing very rapidly as well. So uh, I think it, it's a constant evolving phase. Uh, for us, what is very crucial is the, is the window of uh, going to home uh, versus theatrical is what is the most crucial element. So from the GCF uh, front, that is something which has been discussed at great length. So far as that is something which the industry stays together and protects that, I don't see that there, is be, there would be any challenge in that. And of course, consolidation is continuing. We, we see it to be uh, you know, not, not too many global players in the long run. So that's what uh, we see how things will change. A great insight on this, great insight. Thank 
So we'd like to uh, open up uh, the floor for any questions that you guys might have. There's a question here. Thank you, gentlemen, for this um, informative panel. Uh, I personally, that one of the people that went through a lot of fight in my country, Saudi Arabia, to be supportive for cinemas. And uh, maybe some of our Saudi colleagues, they know how far I went on the media. And thank God, it's now reality. But I have to admit, there is two groups of people who are rejecting cinema in my country. The groups for, and, and what I call it, understandable reason. But the people that they keep in asking me, why cinema now where we do have all those technology, YouTube, Netflix, Showtime, why are we starting from, from the past? Why are we not adopting a new technology? We should have some, uh, what I have the right concern. Like any business industry, taxi industry had been interrupted by Ubers. Uh, department store had been uh, uh, interrupted with e-commerce and they dying in USA and everybody knows that. And many, many, I could tell you, telecommunication, telephones operator had been badly hit also by many things, but they trying. I think the secret for the cinema is to revolution and look to the market itself. Uh, if people, they think just that their job just to put a movie on the theater and that is finished, I think that they will die also one day. Uh, the cinema should be an interactive uh, hub. This big boxes surrounding you. It could be an event boxes, it could be for talented people local to produce movies or produce shows or produce musical shows or, or, or name it. The, the lobby of the cinemas could be also interactive for people to come do their hobbies or entertainment or those uh, disabled. There is hundred and hundred way of making this live box continues to be live and attracting people to show up to that, that box to attend the cinema and see some of the activities uh, without mentioning names. Uh, I once I had a, a cup of coffee in my hand from Starbucks, I entering a cinema and somebody threw me out, said, finish your, star, your coffee outside and come inside because you said, not which this is things doesn't sound, uh, 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 with the nature of the life today. I'm free to buy my coffee from anywhere and drink it since I'm buying from the same mall. But anyway, my point is I want to say it, to, re to, to continue in this business of cinema, you have to be continue to deal with people's emotions and people needs and understanding. I'll give you an example, when you online book a ticket, finish and you have a ticket, that's not enough. Why you don't send me immediately a link for intro for that movie? Whenever you have a new movie, why you don't see me as a loyal programmer and an intro for the new movies that to, to make me hooked up? So a lot of things could, as we hear from our uh, keynote speaking, the, the Twitter and all things. I think that, 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 that we have a big box. If we don't use those big box, one day we'll have the same dilemma of department store disappears. Now department stores disappear and they want to replace with FMB and entertainment and cinema and all those stories. Now one day, if we don't even revolve quickly before Netflix or I don't know who the new technology will show up, we go into the same problem. We have to look for another uh, industry to fill that box. Could be a car show or something else. That's my comment. Thank you. You guys want to uh, give your thoughts, input? Um, we're not going anywhere. We're just getting started. So, um, you know, from a, again, from a Majid Al Fatain perspective, we partner with all the major film festivals. We support local talent. We 100% localize all of our, our teams. Um, we work with local filmmakers. We sponsor filmmaking competitions. And we'll be doing all of that in Saudi Arabia as well. So for us, it's about creating that sustainable ecosystem. We distribute movies. We're going to start producing movies. We're going to produce Saudi Arabian movies so they're locally relevant. So f for Majid Al-Fatayim, again, I 100% agree with you. Um, I think industries have been disrupted when, they're, when, they're, when they get lazy, when they don't have strong competition, when they don't have disruption. And I think if we do that, absolutely we'll face those same challenges. But Majid Al-Fatayim's not going to, so don't worry.
one last question. Anyone? Yes, uh, I think that's the conclusion of our, our panel. Thank you very much, everyone Thank here. Thank, Thank you, you guys for staying with us and listening to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you to our moderator and our esteemed panelists for the very informative discussion. Our next uh, keynote address is by Cornel Thomas. He's an international speaker, author, leadership coach, entrepreneur, population unplugged podcast host, and a TEDx speaker. He travels all over the world sharing his story and his book, Extraordinary, The Distance Between Good and Great. Let's all get ready to be excited for the future and optimistic to where we're headed in the world today. Let's please all welcome him to the stage with a very big round of applause. Can I leave the stage? Is this, is this acceptable? Can I leave the stage? Thank you. All right, stages are not my thing. So my name is Cornell Thomas. I met a bunch of you yesterday. Thank you so much for that lukewarm applause. I really appreciate it. It was great. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to come here today and share a little bit about my story. I've been fortunate enough to speak all over the world. And in my travels, I have met all types of people, all types of races, religions, backgrounds, etc. And the one thing that I can tell you in my travels and meeting all these people we have two very distinct things in common. One, we are all human, and two, we have all been through some type of adversity. And it doesn't matter what you look like or who you pray to, you have been through adversity in your life. If you are sitting in this room, you have experienced it. For me personally, I discovered what adversity was at a very early age. When I was three years old, my father, Bobby Thomas, passed away from cancer. And when my father passed away, he left my mom the task of raising five kids on her own with very little money. One of my brothers happens to also be autistic. So if you know anybody on the autism spectrum, you know it's not like raising a regular child. So that was my first introduction to adversity. So I got to see what struggle and hardship was all about very young. But my father's passing did something to my mom. It changed my mother into an expert problem solver. She had to figure it out. And the reason she had to figure it out, because if she didn't, we wouldn't survive. So I also got to see what determination and grit were about. Grit is one of my favorite words. We all have grit inside of us. Sometimes it's hidden under all the problems that life presents us. When I was growing up, most kids want to be like their father. My father was a police officer in the city of Passaic, New Jersey. He did amazing things in the city. Five years ago, they named a street after him, but I didn't have a connection with my dad. I have two memories of my own of my father, so I didn't want to be a police officer. My mom has worked three jobs since I can remember. In every single one of those jobs, she would come home extremely tired, so I didn't want to do any of those jobs. I didn't want to be a superhero. I didn't want to be... All I wanted to do was be a kid. Now, if you're going through life and you have nothing you're passionate about, the days and years just go by. There's nothing that gets you excited. And when I was 16 years old, all of that changed. My mom is a country girl. <clears throat> She's from a town called Bird's Nest, Virginia. I cannot make this up. Bird's Nest, Virginia is the size of this table. And in Bird's Nest, Virginia, I'm related to everybody in the town. There is one stoplight, and there is one form of entertainment. It was a pool table, and it was missing like five balls. So there is no form of entertainment. And me and my brothers and my little sister would sit in Bird's Nest, Virginia, praying to the heavens that the days would go by faster. And one of these days, I'm sitting on my cousin's bed, and I'm bored out of my mind. And for whatever reason, I look under his bed, and he has hundreds of newspapers, hundreds. 
I pick up one of the newspapers, I hold it up, and there's a picture of my cousin dunking a basketball. I never played organized sports before. I was freaking out. I said, my cousin is famous. He's a superstar. And then I read every single newspaper article, and they're all about my cousin. Carlos Taylor scores 30 points to win. Carlos Taylor brings Northampton to victory. Carlos Taylor this, Carlos Taylor that. And then I looked on his wall, and on his wall, he had 50 high school pictures of the prettiest girls I've ever seen in my life. So I started to do this equation in my head. If I play basketball, not only could I be famous, but I might be able to get a date. And that was big for a 16-year-old, especially when you're in Birds Nest, Virginia, and you're related to every girl in town. So I told myself, I'm going to be a basketball player, no matter what. I'm going to be a basketball Never played basketball before in my life. No one in my family plays basketball. I was like, this is me. 16. So my mom drives us back to civilization, a.k.a. our house. I get this basketball from in the basement. I put it under my arms. I walk three miles to the nearest basketball court. My son is three. Or my son is five. I'm going to tell him it was 15 miles that I walked. But for you and me, it was three. I get to the hoop. And I say, here it is, fame, girls, I might be on Oprah. I throw the ball up, the ball goes over the hoop and rolls down the hill. I said, oh, maybe it rained last week. Let me wipe, <laughs> let me wipe my hands off. Let me try this again. I said, no, I'm, I'm going to be a basketball player. This, is, this, has, this, is, this is, has to happen. This is written. Throw the ball up again. Looked like I got tasered. Over the hoop, rolled down the hill. I did that for two more hours, and then I realized something. I suck at basketball. Like, I'm really bad. And as I'm sitting there, wondering what I'm going to do, out of the woods, this little five-foot-eight Filipino guy comes walking towards the court. <laughs> I cannot make this up. He comes walking towards the court, and he goes, hi, my name is Ray. Do you want me to show you how to shoot a basketball? Now think of this aesthetically. Six foot five black guy, five foot eight Filipino guy, he's gonna show me how to play basketball. Michael Jordan isn't five foot eight and Filipino. He looks kind of like me. So I've always been open to learning. So I said, sure, show me how to shoot a basketball. And for the next three hours, this man Ray showed me how to properly shoot a basketball. And what Ray did that day is one of the reasons that I speak. Ray gave me something that was priceless, his time. As business owners and as humans, you have to understand when you give anyone your time, there is no value amount that you can put on that. There's no dollar amount that you can put on time. I will never get this half hour back. When I'm on my deathbed and I'm praying to who I pray to and saying, please give me another half hour, I'm going to say, oh, man, I was in Dubai that one time, and I gave that conference to the people that gave me a lukewarm introduction, and, yeah, I can't get that back. So my first book is called The Power of Positivity. In that second chapter, it is entitled Ray, because Ray did something that is very special and something that I aim to do every time I go speak. Ray planted a seed in my head that if I work hard enough, I could get better. Every single one of you, this is a garden. Whatever you plant grows. So if you say to yourself, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not the correct shade, I'm not the correct gender, anything you want to say to yourself, whatever you plant there, it will grow. I don't plant that in my head. I told you yesterday, I am a crazy person. I plant, man, if I told you the things I plant in my head, you'd be like, yeah, he's crazy. So I go to my tryouts for high school my junior year, I get cut. My senior year, everybody makes the team. There's nowhere they can put me. And I started to have doubt. And in this room, there are some dreamers. And you'd be lying if you said that you didn't have doubt from time to time. But I'm going to leave you with something that I hope that you write down or you remember. You cannot let doubt stop your due. 
That means you cannot let doubt stop your action. And you have to understand that even when you're taking baby steps towards your goal, there are still steps. That is very important. That's worth the price of admission. Actually, this is expensive. It's probably not the worth of the price of admission, but it's, it's important, right? So don't let doubt stop you do. I never stop working. And my friends would tell me all the time, Cornell, let's go out, let's go out hanging out, let's go chase girls, let's blah, 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 blah. What they didn't understand is that I made a promise to my mother. I told my mom, my mom is an extraordinary woman. She is the reason I am who I am right now. I said to my mom, I said, mom, I'm going to tell you a secret that you cannot share with my brothers and my sister because they were probably going to laugh. And she said, what, what's the secret, baby boy? Still calls me baby boy. Still. My mom's five foot two. She calls me baby boy. I said, mom, I'm going to play professional basketball. And she looked at me right in the eyes. And she said, that's great. What do you want for dinner? And I said, I don't, th I don't think you understand me. I said, I'm going to play professional basketball, like in the NBA, not getting my MBA, in the NBA. And she said, I heard you. What do you want for dinner? Like, what is up with mom today? Oh, okay, a lasagna? I don't know. So my senior year comes around, and I used to have people tell me all the time how bad I was at something, right, how bad I was at basketball. Imagine every day waking up and someone saying, you know what, you're terrible at what you do. You're god-awful at what you do. Every day. My brother had these group of guys that would pick me up, take me to the basketball court, beat me up for two hours, then bring me home, drop me off and say, hey, you're terrible. See you tomorrow. And do the same thing the next day. Whenever someone is saying negative words to you, and all of you have experienced it because we're all humans, I will say this. You can't let negative words stop your positive action. So... If you let someone's criticism of you stop what you're doing, that is no longer their fault. That is your fault. Solely. Their words. Now, if you hit me with a baseball bat, that would be different. That will hurt. That might stop me for a little bit. Probably going to be a little bit angry, too, if I'm still alive. You should, should probably run. But if you're saying words to me, I'm not going to let them affect me. So after my senior year of high school, no colleges were recruiting me. Big shocker, I averaged one point a game in high school. I'm surprised Duke wasn't calling me. And they had this whole wall of everybody going to different colleges. Syracuse, Villanova, Coastal Carolina, North Carolina. And then there was a picture of me. And it was blank. And I will never forget walking past that frame. And my friends telling me, Cornell, where are you going to go to school? And me having to say, ah, oh, well, I don't know. But the answer was, we don't have the money to go to college. So my mom sat me down and she said just that. She said, baby boy, she goes, I can't pay for college. I said, all right, I'm going to take a year off. I'm going to work two jobs. I'm going to work my own way through college. I'll do it. I'm solution-based, not problem-based. People sit down and they do this, give me, give me. I wasn't brought up that way. If you want something, get it. If you want change, make it happen. So I worked two jobs. And I went to a junior college, went to a two-year school. And now it's four years for me first playing basketball. And for the first time in my life, I make the newspaper. Actually, it was my friend. It wasn't me. <laughs> my friend was, I was behind him like this. But I cut it out. All right, I don't want to lie to you. So I cut it out. And then my sophomore year, something happened. First team all conference, first team all region, number three in the state in scoring, blah, 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 blah. All these accolades. And everybody is freaking out except for myself and Tina Thomas, because everybody sees where you land. No one sees the work that you put in, right? It's like the story of the bamboo tree. You water it, water it, water it, water it, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. And then five years later, it grows exponentially. I was the bamboo tree. I was terrible, God awful for five years, and then it hit. And when it hit, I was ready. People are like, be ready in case something bad happens. You got to be ready for success. Because when colleges started calling me, I was ready. I was like, where are you? North Dakota? Don't know where that is. Free scholarship? I'll be there. So I play in North Dakota. Had two good seasons. Come home. And I'm playing with 
people that play in the NBA. I'm training with these NBA players. I'm seven years removed from being cut from my high school team. I'm playing with NBA guys. They're driving up in Bentleys and Lamborghinis. I have a 1989 Mercury Sable. I have to keep the heat on during the summer for the car to run. My radio was a CD player. I had my headphones on. So I'm pulling up to this Lamborghini like, hi, neighbor, getting out, and then playing with these guys. But I realized something. These guys have been doing this their whole entire life, and I still belong with them. That's a really good feeling. It's a good feeling when you know that your work ethic is so strong that it doesn't matter how much longer someone's been doing something than you, you can still catch them. Work ethic is the great balancer. You can catch them if you work hard enough. You can catch them if you believe enough. So a couple years, a year goes by. I'm on my computer. I'm a little bit older, so I'm looking at my MySpace. For any of you guys that remember MySpace, it's a long time ago. There's no recognition in the crowd. That's okay. I'll just keep talking. So I'm looking at my MySpace, and I get an email, an AOL message. You probably, I don't know if you remember that. AOL. That's when the email will come through. It will take an hour to read each line. And my agent goes, Cornell, you got a contract to play in Lisbon, Portugal, the top division. The only thing is you have to leave in two weeks. I go running to my mother, the woman who, she's responsible for everything that I do. And I said, Mom, I said, I got a contract to play professional basketball. I swear to you, she said, that's great, baby. What do you want for dinner? And I realized that my mom wasn't blowing off my dream. It's just that she had so much faith and belief in what I do that, of course, you're playing professional basketball. Of course, you're getting a college scholarship. Of course, you want to play in the NBA, right? Because that's how I raised you. And it wasn't through words. It was through action. I'm a week away, 168 hours away from playing professional basketball. We have this big going away party, huge. There were three people. <laughs> we didn't even have a cake. We had like a cupcake because we didn't have any money. So uh, it was like congrats. I was like, keep the chalations off. That's an extra 250. Just congrats. We get it. I'm going away. We get it. And so I'm out with my friends, and we're just shooting around. And I go to the basket, and I hear a pop. And I fall on the ground. And I go to get back up. I go to put my right foot on the ground, and I fall again. And my friends come running over, and they pick me up. And the first thing I asked them was, who stepped on my heel? They said, Cornell, no one was around you. And so I go to put weight on my right foot. I can't put any weight on my right foot. I drive myself to the hospital. I drag my foot up to the emergency room, and I don't call my mom. Because if I call my mom, whatever this is, is real. And eventually, after a couple of hours, I call her. She gets to the hospital in five minutes. We live 40 minutes away. I don't know how many lives she took to get there, but she got there. And this doctor by the name of Dr. Bradish goes, Grinnell, I'm going to grab the back of your calf muscle. If you feel excruciating pain, we have to do surgery on Thursday. Now, understand something. I'm 168 hours away. He's saying I'm going to do surgery on Thursday. He felt the back of my calf muscle. This, to this day, that Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I have no recollection. All I remember is Thursday morning being wheeled in for surgery, Thursday afternoon coming out with a hard cast from the middle of my thigh to the end of my foot, and by Thursday night, my contract was voided. In one day, worst case scenario happened in my life. I didn't tell you why I wanted to play professional basketball. It was no longer to get girls and be famous. I want to play professional basketball so my mom never had to work again. So my purpose was true. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I'm good to people, all this stuff. And then now this happens. So what did that do to my psyche? Well, what happens when people find out they have a terminal illness? There's five stages to it. The first stage is denial. The second stage is anger. The third stage is bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And they said that mirrors whenever you have to go through some dramatic change. Now, if you look at my story, I went through all those stages, but then I landed in depression. And I was upset and pissed off and angry at the world for that day. 
and I started to think about my mom. And I started to think about we'd come home from school and our lights would be cut off because we couldn't pay the bill. My mom would just walk in and start handing out flashlights and lighting candles. Or we wouldn't have any hot water. And she'd boil the cold water, put it in the bathtub, mix it so we can take baths. I said, you were raised by a solution-based woman, and here you are thinking the world is over over something that is eventually going to get better. So what are you going to do? Are you going to be a why me person, or are you going to be a what now person? And that's what you need to ask yourself in life. What am I going to be? When things happen, when it hits the fan, are you going to be why me? Why is this happening? Or are you going to say, well, let me pick myself up by the bootstraps. Yeah, this sucks, but I can get through it. So that's what I did. I called my best friend up the next day. I said, pick me up on Monday. He came to pick me up on Monday. And I was shooting from a chair for the next six months, like this. Then I was shooting from, from a crutch. And did that make me a better basketball player? No, but it made me better mentally. It took my mind away from this situation. Understand something about God. Understand something about the universe. You get signs, you have this intuition. They call it women's intuition, right? But guys have it too if they're aware enough. Where you realize you're not going where you're supposed to go, right? You ever go to a party when you're younger and you're like, ah, this doesn't feel right, right? Or you talk to someone and you have a very bad vibe from them. I started to get this vibe like basketball wasn't it. And I was working out at my old junior college. And my coach, former coach, who's now the athletic director, said, Cornell, would you like to coach basketball? And I said, no. Thank you for asking. And I was so tunnel vision focused, I thought he was disrespecting me by saying, like, I can't play professional basketball. When I say I was, I'm a psycho, like, I mean it. So I, what did I do? I put him right on that chip of my shoulder with everybody else that told me I couldn't do anything. Now, let me tell you something about that chip that you have on your shoulder. And some of you have it in here. I can see it. Some of you have a big chip on your shoulder. Like, I can't wait. I'm going to have a billion dollar business, I'm going to show everybody. It comes from a negative place. Why? Because you shouldn't be trying to prove people wrong. You should be trying to prove yourself right. And if your expectations are bigger than anybody else's expectations, who cares what they think or who cares what they say? Screw them. So my girlfriend's on the phone with me and she goes, I think you'll be a fantastic coach. And I hung up on her. I put her on the chip. I was like, who's next? Then I told to my mom, <laughs> you, don't hang up on, <laughs> you don't hang up on Tina Thomas if you want to live. And she said, go for the interview. So I go for the interview. And my coach is interviewing me, and I'm sitting there with my arms crossed like this, defiant. Two days later, I have an orange whistle around my neck and 15 guys calling me coach. And I'm like, how in the heck did this happen? But as I'm coaching these young men, I realize something. My purpose wasn't to play basketball. It was to help other people. And I went through about 10 years of coaching. And my son, Bryce, who's five years old, he was about to be born. And I'm talking to my wife, and I'm saying, if I coach Division I basketball, which is in the States, the top level of college, I'll never see him, ever. <clears throat> the schedule is so strenuous that I'd be in the gym at 7 a.m., and I'd be gone at midnight. So I would miss everything, all his development. And I started to get this pull that you need to go somewhere else. And Facebook was the pull I needed. It was the push. And you might be saying, well, oh, does he know Mark Zuckerberg? No, I don't know Zuck. But I opened my Facebook one day, and I read my timeline. If you want to be depressed in the morning, read your timeline. Before you drink your coffee, go to Facebook and read your timeline. It's great for depression. It makes you depressed. Literally. This is what I read that day. Oh my God, my boyfriend is so terrible. My job is so miserable. I hate my job. My Benz has a flat tire. All these first world problems. So I took a, I have a book of positive quotes. I took a quote. I put it on Facebook. A positive one. And people started to like it. Even the drama bombs started to like it. So I said, okay, maybe I have something. And one day I woke up, and I couldn't find the book. So I made my own quote. People still liked it. So I'm like, screw the book. I'm going to make my own quote. And six months go by. And my friend goes, Cornell, where do you get your quotes from? And I was like, 
Well, actually, I make it myself. He's like, that's really cool. You should write, you should write a blog. He's like, that's a great idea. What the hell is a blog? And he, we were in Panera Bread, and he wrote up a WordPress blog. And I did my first blog. It was called Risk. And I started writing them every Saturday. And people started to like it. And we don't realize how much power our words have. Like right now, some of you that are awake still, I'm saying things and you're nodding because these are things that you've heard before that you say to yourself. That's the power of words. So I said, I'm going to write a book. What the, what's the book going to be called? The Power of Positivity, Controlling Where the Ball Bounces. And when I talk about positivity, I don't talk about rainbows and butterflies. No. I don't say, oh, you know, just be happy every day and smile. That's not positivity. That's stupidity. Positivity is in the absence of human emotion. Positivity is not living in negative emotion. Think about the analogy of a snowball. Think about negativity as a snowball, right? You wake up in the morning, you stub your toe. Oh, man, that sucks. Then you go downstairs, and your latte isn't hot enough. You add to that snowball. And then you're going to work, and grandma just got out of bingo, and she's driving super slow, and you're late to work. The snowball gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And now the next thing you know, you're dealing with an avalanche. It's very hard to stop an avalanche. It's very easy to stop a snowball. My second book was called The Power of Me, Army of One. It was about being great. And that's another foreign concept. That's why we have so many average people on this planet. I can't possibly be great. There's no way. Where whatever you want to be in life is being done already for billions of dollars. Think about it. Anything that you want to be, any profession you want to be, someone's doing it and making millions if not billions of dollars. What's the difference? You're human, they're human. The difference is your excuses or your work ethic or a combination of both. To be great, you have to do three things. Try to remember this. It's very easy. The first thing you have to do is visualize it. You have to see it. When I was terrible at basketball, I used to close my eyes, and I was the best basketball player in the world. The second thing, you have to believe it. This is really cool, but it does nothing. Believing it, that's where the action comes in. And the third thing, you have to work your butt off to make it happen. Period. So, my last thing I talked about, I did a TED talk about it, was purpose. Foreign concept to a lot of people. When I talk in the States and I go all over, especially in the States, people think that they just exist. Like, why do you exist? I don't know. Do you want to know? Not really. Then they go on their iPhone. I want to give you a story real quick. I used to work in this pharmacy. I sold lottery tickets and cigarettes. I was 17 years old, and there was an older gentleman that used to come into the pharmacy every single day. This doesn't work? I'm good. I'm good. But I'll use two mics. I don't care. Hello? Hello. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I work in this pharmacy. Now it doesn't work. Okay, well. I worked in this pharmacy. Hello, everybody. So I worked in this pharmacy, and this older guy used to come into the pharmacy every single day. And he used to buy hundreds of lottery tickets. Hundreds. Not five, not ten. Hundreds. And one day he came up to me and said, young man, can I tell you something? I said, sure. He goes, I've been playing the lottery for 30 years, and I've never gotten more than three numbers. And so in my mind, I was like, stop. <laughs> like, save your money. But if you think about that, think about the millions of people that play the lottery in the States and never win. And there's a simple reason for it. For you to win the lottery is a 1 in 175 million chance. 1 in 175 million chance. That is like me going outside of this hotel, being struck by lightning, coming back in, getting hit by the same lightning bolt, only to go back outside and get eaten by a unicorn. That's what that odd is. Now, for you to be born is 1 in 400 trillion. 
I'll say it again. I don't know if you got it or not. For you to be born, to be on this earth, is one in 400 trillion. Horace Mann once said, you are whatever you pretend to be. If you want to pretend that you don't have purpose, if you want to pretend that you're not good enough, if you don't want to pretend there's no reason for you to exist, so be it. I cannot convince you. But I am telling you, there's a reason for everything. I was interviewed uh, for a local paper, and I got the chance to interview my mom. And I said, Mom, what was your dreams? What was your purpose? And she said, baby boy, my only purpose in life was to make sure that you guys were raised right. If it wasn't for my mom, I would not be here. Your purpose doesn't have to be some grandiose thing. Your purpose could be just saving your house. Your purpose could be just raising your kids. Your purpose could be just being kind. Imagine that. My mom's purpose was on the micro, so mine can be on the macro. We all woke up today. Congratulations. This is the lottery. We all woke up. My big question to you is, what are you going to do with that opportunity? Thank you so much, guys. Thank you very much, Cornelia, for the wonderful presentation. We are continuing with our next panel discussion on future-proof marketing. The discussion is focused on emerging retail brands, the evolution of consumer markets, effective marketing strategies, consumer experiences, AI and technology, and connecting online and physical stores experience. Let's please welcome to the stage our moderator back again, David Merman Scott. Let's welcome him once again. And our first panelist, Alex Anderex, he has held senior leadership roles with Unilever, Ujan Industries, Imar Properties, and Omniad Properties prior to establishing his own entrepreneurial venture with Andrakis Advisory Services. It's a hybrid management consultancy and creative agency based in Dubai, UAE. Let's welcome him as well to the stage, please. Our next panelist is Nada Abu Saab. She is the Marketing Director, East Region Shopping Malls for Majid Al Qutaym Properties. In her current role, she oversees some of the region's leading retail and leisure destinations in the UAE, Bahrain, and Oman. Let's please also welcome her to the stage. Let's welcome Stacey McClare. She's the CEO of Life on Screen USA, an achievement driven omni channel brand and marketing communication strategist who has spent over two decades working with the world's most notable multi million dollar companies, including leadership roles at Clinique, Havas, and most recently, Lancome. Let's all welcome Stacey, please. We are going to have a lot of fun with this panel. These guys are fabulous, and we're going to be talking about a lot of different things. I'm going to kick it off right away, and I'm going to jump into this question. When I was on stage a moment ago, I talked about the revolution that's in all of our pockets, the real-time revolution that's happening right now. People are communicating instantly using the device in our pockets. But at the same time, the retail business that we're all in is thousands and thousands of years old. People have been doing retail for as long as humans had any form of money, little shells that we gave to other humans to get something in return. So is there a way that this new modern world can connect with this ancient world of retail. I'll start with you, Stacey. What do you think? Well, I think when you see Amazon opening a store in New York City, 
the online mecca of everything going brick and mortar, I think we're seeing changes in retail for sure. Absolutely. Abs absolutely. Yeah. And, and what, did, what do you think they can do to bring those two things together? How can they um, do what they're doing so well online to the offline world? What do they need to do to, to get those things to happen? I think they're capitalizing on the customer experience. And we all know that to get engagement and to get customers to pay attention to our brands and our companies is a very different experience today than it was just a few years ago. And when we look at how to get customers to give us the brand love that we need, we need to reach them directly, we need to give them calls to action, and we need to, them to love us as brands and companies as much as we love them as our customers. Do you, do you think that that um, store will just be a place that people sort of f look physically and then they end up buying online? Or will they actually make a transaction in those stores and will that then grow the way that uh, Apple has done with their stores? I think so far, early stages, they're seeing both. Um, I can tell you Amazon is opening a cashierless store in New York before the end of the year. And the idea is that we all can walk in and pick all the things that we like and we don't have to but we don't have to pick, we don't have to go to a scanner, we don't have to go to a cashier, and we can choose to have it delivered because I don't know how many more New Yorkers are in the room, but I don't want to schlep bags up Fifth Avenue and all the way home. I want them delivered to my doorstep. So fortunately, we'll have the option of both, and we don't have to self-scan, we don't have to deal with anyone else scanning our things. We'll have the option of just having it delivered the way we want it. Fa so. Fabulous. Nada, what do you think this intersection between this ancient world of retail and this modern world of the real-time culture? Uh, I think the retail industry has been evolving since the beginning. I mean, there was the introduction of catalogs, for those who remember, the move to suburban malls, then there was the rise of Walmart, e-commerce, Amazon. So um, I think the difference is now the pace, and this is what we refer to as disruption. Uh, adapting and evolving is key but also because customer experience is quite important. And if you look at the consumer journey in retail, it has changed in the level of complexity. So the people now, they're starting their journey and they're ending it on different channels. 28% yeah. of the people, they check prices on their phones, right? 47% of connected people globally still insist that they need to check the product physically. So, um, in order to evolve with that, we need to definitely engage with our customers, measure their level of satisfaction across this journey, and try to anticipate the needs. So we've introduced hands-free shopping in Mall of the Emirates, and now it's being rolled out in two other malls, City Center, Murdoch, and Bahrain. And the reason we did that was really to address that key pain point in the mall, because people didn't want to carry shopping bags. Right. They want the convenience, right? So how can we increase dwell time? And now, to date, we've delivered 40,000 bags, and uh, phase two is being designed based also on consumer uh, feedback. So two fabulous examples of how that intersection is working. Alex, I'm gonna change the subject a little bit. Hope you don't mind. Um, we were talking earlier before we jumped on about a lot of different uh, uh, things that are happening in the world that you're seeing. Um, one thing that we chatted about briefly is there's the personal world that we live in in social media and there's the business world that we operate in as professionals. So many people are not mixing those two worlds. They say, oh well, Facebook is just for my friends and when I'm on business, I'm only doing LinkedIn because that's the business channel. Um, what's, what are your thoughts, Alex, on the idea of mixing business and pleasure and, and, and hey, I'm going to share a family photo on my business channel or I'm going to focus on, uh, uh, on showing people who I am as a human. Yeah. I think that's one of, the, one of the interesting things when we talk about the physical and digital uh, phenomena and we talk about how do you get them to merge. I think one of the, whilst we've seen the explosion on digital, one of the things digital can never ever deliver for you is the the personality of the brand that you're working with. Um, it can in the way it looks and feels, but you don't, you don't get that sense when you're, when you're online that you are actually in the world of that brand. Uh, because it is, in many cases, two-dimensional, right? So three-dimensional. To answer your, to, to get into your specific question there, I think one of the things that I, 
that I try and uh, discuss many times with, with our clients is they need to understand and we need to understand the difference between digital marketing and digital media, right? And they are different, right? So in many cases you sit there and you say, okay, I need to have a digital plan and that digital plan needs to cover X, Y, Z because this is where I believe uh, the majority of my people are going to be. Um, that's not digital marketing, right? That you, you need to look at digital media in very much to say, where is my audience going to be? Where are my buyers going to be? As opposed to, I need to have it on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. So one of the, one of the key changes coming through now, especially for media companies, is how do you work on programmatic content that trawls the type of buyer that you want because they have actually interacted with a site or with a environment looking for that type of service or product. So, so you talked about personality. Do you truly believe that brands can have personality? Absolutely. And one of the, one of the greatest transitions that I've seen, I've been in this region now for 28 years. So it was pre the opening of Mall of Emirates and the, you know, the real mega mall delivery. And one of the things that, that I see is more and more brands that have personality require packaging. So you're starting to see a lot more happening now with the merchandising. Merchandising, whilst this region leads the world in many of the deliverables on retail, it still hasn't caught up with the, with the world on merchandising. The window displays, the, the interactivity with what you can do um, with your brand. So you walk through the streets of Milan, you walk through the streets of Rome, you see this fabulous packaging of brands in their store frontages. We're not quite there at that level of sophistication yet. So that is part of that introduction of who am I as a brand uh, as, as customers do their journey design through your mall. And, and of course, who you are as a brand also includes who are the people within the company and their personal brands extend the brand of the organization. Yet what I see so often, especially in this re region, is the reluctance for people to push themselves out there. Um, we actually tweeted during my talk. Um, thank you for that. Um, what, what would be your advice, Stacey, to people who are personally fearful of putting themselves out there on the social platforms and, and putting their, per, their, their personal personality out as an aspect of their business personality. You're asking a person that started social media for the largest beauty brand in the United States. That's exactly <laughs> why I'm asking you that. So now I'm gonna tell you, put it out there, put give, it out there. Give, <laughs> us the, give us the back story. Um, no, essentially I think it's a delicate balance, right? I mean, your Instagram, your Instagram channel now is a lot of who you are. And you have to be careful about how much exposure that you have to your personal brand, just as we do to our larger brands, and how much interaction we want, and how much engagement that we want. And I find it interesting, personally, when I post things that I think will get a lot of engagement, whether it's a celebrity or a big event, uh, I, the engagement is OK. When I post the photo of me and my best friend, and half of my followers have no idea who they are, the engagement is unbelievable. There's something about that authenticity that I think is essential, and I've seen it personally and I've seen it professionally, so I think it's a delicate balance. Decide who you want to be. You have the luxury of doing that, and balance that with you know, your professional life and your personal life and your families, and, but I think it's a great way to interact and communicate. We're all about omnichannel approaches now. Nada, as a leader in your organization, do you feel as if we should be insisting that leaders are out there in a public way? Should the presidents of companies, the CEOs, the, the heads of departments um, be, can, should that be an aspect of their job or do you think it's just optional? I think we're all brand ambassadors. At the end of the day, we all reflect what we believe and we reflect the values of our company. Um, is it a must for a CEO, for example, to be active on the social media? I think there is an understandable reluctance for some personalities not to do so, but um, there are other leaders that can take on the lead, and uh, again, we're all brand ambassadors. 
Yeah, it'd be interesting fast forwarding to 10 or 20 years um, when the younger generation has risen. Um, I, I, I would imagine we would have a very different answer. Alex, did you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, I mean, I think just to answer the question on um, with our millennial generation today, one of the things they value most is authenticity. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're going to target millennials, you have to be real. Uh, in terms of leaders, uh, as ambassadors, I think in many cases it, it, it fits the bill. Uh, and one of the things that a leader can do, of course, is attitude internally reflects leadership, uh, both internally and externally. So the question becomes, can, can that delivery be done in line with the brand they represent? Yeah. Okay. So in many cases, if you are the CEO of Boeing, you may not be in the public domain as much as if you were the CEO of Virgin, mm. right? Where Virgin is very much an, ex an external brand. It's an extroverted brand. It's a brand that wants to have a connection with uh, B2B, B2C, the range of uh, target audiences. Whereas a brand like Boeing is very much a you know, business to government, business to business. That CEO may not need to be as exposed uh, as that. Moving on to the, the question you talk about in 10 to 20 years, um, one of the things that we're going to have to get used to is very few of the generation of today are joining an organization thinking, I'm here for the next 20 years. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So, it's one of the worst point. questions you can ask a new graduate today is, where do you see yourself in five years? Because they're likely to answer, not here. And what's really so. interesting about that is if uh, if people's careers now span five or even ten companies, it means an, a personal brand is absolutely required. Because if you don't have a personal brand online, it's way harder um, to get noticed and to have those senior opportunities right. come up. I want to switch, switch gears a little bit and talk about um, the uh, opportunities and challenges with digital advertising. And what I mean is, the technologies around digital advertising allow us to have incredible power, right? We have the power to be able to do re retargeting. In other words, follow people around um, as they're, um, as they're uh, uh, going about their life online. With GPS capability, we're able to know where people are. Um, you know, I was recently shopping for underwear, and then a couple of days later, underwear pops up on my on my on my various feeds. It's we like know a lot about I, your I'm underwear. so I'm so glad <laughs> that there was there was nobody looking over my shoulder at that point, you know, to see what I was doing. So we've got this creepiness factor going on. It is creepy in many ways, but it's also wildly um, um, effective in some ways. So on one hand, brands have this opportunity to do that. On the other hand, they have the challenge of not being seen as intrusive, as not being seen as, um, as being too, too invasive. Nada, what do you think about how can these digital technologies work to get attention at the same time without risking that our brand is looked bad on? Um, I think it's quite important that uh, relevance is taken into consideration. As you said before, I, per, for example, I'm not interested in an ad that, you know, uh, talks about pregnancy pills. I'm not planning on getting pregnant anytime soon. So it's very important that we connect with our customers with relevant content. And this is where digital advertising helps us to do that because we need to connect with them at the right time, with a relevant message. Ideally, we would like to even pre, pre, uh, preempt your, your needs and your wants. So try to target you before you even know what you want. Uh, and this is when it's quite powerful. Um, content has to be quite thoughtful. It's not about only driving an action, but it's also about evoking an emotion, a thought, a conversation. And it's quite important as well to measure not only conversion, but the emotional response to that content. Because I believe we shouldn't be targeting customers, we should be connecting with mm -hmm. these customers. And this is where we can build loyalty and long-term conversion. And, and Stacey, you've had tons of experience in this area. I know from your background in consumer goods. Um, wh what are your thoughts on, 
I just call it the creepiness factor, the creepiness. And, and how to it's terrifying, how to isn't it? manage it's the creepiness factor of, of underwear following. I'm you. not sharing my underwear brand, David. <laughs> it's not happening. I'm sorry, um, but I do think it's interesting because at the end of the day, you know, when we started our conversation today, we talked about Amazon going to brick and mortar, which is exactly what Amazon wasn't doing. And I look at brands like Lancôme and in department stores and freaking out, going everything's going online and going digital. Yet we find ourselves within advertising in the US going back to out of home, right? It's a $4.6 billion industry in the US anticipated by 2019. And that's expected to grow 3% over the next three years. So what the finding is, is that in digital out of home or out of home period, is that there's a lot of relevance, right? There's a lot of ability to specifically target a consumer exactly where they are, exactly the message that you want to give them at the right time in the right place. And I talked a little bit about brand love. And what better way to get brand love than to get somebody's attention right where you want them, talking about what you want, when they want. But that's easier said than done. I went through a walk through Times Square the other day, which I avoid at all costs. <laughs> 24 years in New York City, I think I've done it twice. And, and it was last month was both, the second both time. Both times with t people who are from out of town. Talk right? about <laughs> creepy people. <laughs> I mean, that, that'll do it. And it's interesting to see how many static billboards there still are for out of home. And they, they sit there for a month or two. And you'll see Fashion Week. Well, Fashion Week was over, you know, three months ago. Or a the movie, next a movie that February. opened. Us. Or a movie theater opening. So the work that I'm doing now with Life on Screen, which is so wonderful, is that it's an easy way to co distribute content, not just ads, but to distribute content in a relevant way, in a contextual way, with a call to action that means something and that engages the consumer and they actually remember. And it's not quite as creepy as the rest of it. So. I'd like to s find out if there's anybody in the audience who might have a question either for any one of us on the panel or for the, the entire panel. We've got a, a couple minutes for that possibility. Is there anybody would like to ask a question? Be thinking about that and raise your hand in a second if you have one. Um, hashtags, which we've been talking about today, and the ability to search on social networks means that, um, that brands can really find out what people are talking about now. Like, what are they talking about literally this second? What's on people's minds? Um, are they engaged with a particular brand? And in what way are they engaged with a particular brand? Sort of following on to, uh, again, the creepiness factor. Alex, um, uh, how, what is the appropriate way for a brand to follow a conversation that already exists online, um, perhaps on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, doesn't matter, and then um, be a, become a part of that conversation in a way that it doesn't seem intrusive? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the points of the word that was used quite often uh, in the last 20 odd minutes has been relevance. Yeah. So the question is to know it's like when you're having a regular conversation with people, you've got to understand when you can come into that conversation and when you're not um, becoming nuisance value versus when you're actually adding value to that conversation. Now that becomes, that just requires a lot more um, analytics from a digital uh, perspective to understand at what stage of conversations do I come in. Uh, just, to, just on the creepiness part of it, there, there, there are... <laughs> That's the word of the day. Yeah. I'm actually a big fan. I think that there needs to be some form of regulation as well because the whole industry could get tainted by what I call an undisciplined advertiser. So Interesting. To, so what to, kind of regulation? Yeah, so, so today, I mean, I'm, I look at my own personal situation today. Today... I get bombarded by an average of 30 real estate ads a day. I get bombarded by at least 40 banks a day. And I get bombarded by uh, about... You're talking about online? Yeah, online. Or through SMS. And I get hit by wealth management companies, right? It's got to the point where it's actually, I want to call the police, <laughs> right? Because it's, no it's no longer creepy. It's now, it, it, it's affecting wow. my life. Regulation. So it's, 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 I'm being harassed. Right? So the question becomes, for there needs to be some form of regulation because I believe people should have the ability to be targeted on brands that they, they, are, they are interested in 
and brands that they have started conversations with or brands that they have engaged with in terms of either downloading an app or applying on a website or filling in a form that I've given people permission to talk to me. When that permission hasn't been given to me, it becomes harassment the same way as it does if I'm following someone down the street. Wow, what do you think on that uh, regulation on online advertising? What do you think? Um, I think uh, I agree with you, Alex, totally. Wow, interesting. But at the same time, um, I also believe that some of our customers want to connect with us on a personal level. So it's the other way around yeah. as well. And as you said in your book, David, it's not a one-way relationship anymore. It's a two-way. And uh, in order to leverage on that, uh, let them be part of the storytelling. The recent example during the world of fashion, we invited the social influencers and the global influencers to take part of the event. But the way we took it to the next level is we actually invited some of those influencers to be the models at the catwalk. Mm. So the level of authenticity oh, so and, 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 and realness of the event uh, was really there and real-time engagement spiked. So they, they weren't just watching, they were actually participating. They were participating. They actually selected the items themselves from different boutiques in the malls and hashtagging was, uh, you know, definitely being created and, uh, and not, it wasn't only from the social influencers themselves, it was also from their followers. So, um, yeah, I believe in a, in a relationship you know, building with, with our customers and, and Who should be doing that, Stacey? Who, who should be the people within an organization that are actually doing the engagement? Is there a social media department? Is oh it my God, this is every, my favorite subject. Is it, every, up for this is it this everyone's is job? job? Is it like, if you have 100,000 employees in your company, should 100,000 people be engaged? Please, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that, you know, there's always this topic of discussion. Is social media PR or is it marketing? Any good organization structure will have PR and marketing working hand in hand in an integrated capacity. Um, but that's not always the case. But social media is an external communication, right? We talked about should we do it as, as leaders, professionally and personally, and where do you blur those lines? But I think at the end of the day, it is a communication that you want to control to some level. And I do see it um, as something that sits strongly within an integrated communications mm -hmm. division. Because people go rogue, right? They get excited, especially if you have a sales team. Lancome has a sales force in the US just in department stores alone of 5,000 beauty advisors. Imagine if we let them all do and say whatever they felt like. Right. You know? So you have to be careful, but you have to let people express how they feel. And one of the things we found as an organization that was very helpful is that sometimes your sales force, whether it's beauty advisors or whatever else around the world, they can be your biggest brand ambassadors. And they have very strong followings. So strategically leveraging them as mouthpieces internally for external communications is also a big win. Um, any, uh, any questions from the audience? I'm going to check one more time. Yes, Alex, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I think just on that one, I think the, really, the companies that do that really, really well, they integrate their PR, social media, influencer marketing, detailed content plan, detailed messaging matrix, uh, and if it's well controlled and well designed, they'll come back to design. Um, message design is as critical as the message. And the timing of that delivery and consistency in messaging. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things you mentioned earlier, Nada, bring in the social social influence into the game. That can only happen if it's been designed to create that ecosystem of delivery. Of so I think a lot a lot more time and effort has to be spent in designing the content roadmap, developing the content stimulus. Um, because then delivery of that becomes so much easier, A, to control, and B, to create it in a manner that has the greatest impact. I actually disagree. I, I think that um, the idea of control when it comes to social media, I think, can become dangerous for brands. And I have a different model that I would like to suggest as an option, which is that we have we allow people within our companies to communicate through social media, but we make it extremely clear 
that they're not communicating on behalf of the company, that they're communicating for themselves, they happen to be an employee, and that they use, they don't ever use the word we, as in we at this company say this. That's, that's the corporate communications department, that's the marketing department. But they say I, you know, I'm a salesperson at this company, here's what I think. Um, so it's kind of changing the model slightly and saying, if you feel compelled to do social media, here are a few guidelines. The most important guideline is you always speak in the first person and you never speak on behalf of the brand. So that's just a different model, not that it's right or wrong. It's kind of a religious debate sometimes. Uh, we have time for one more question. And I, I wanted to pose this to each of you and we're each gonna have a minute. Um, and that is, is it possible to, and we, we've sort of, We've sort of touched on this a little bit, but is it possible to truly create a unified brand, both offline and online? So when the consumer sees us, they say, yes, that is the brand I know either in the store and that is also the brand I know uh, in my social networks and that is the same brand I know if I visit their e-commerce site. Uh, who would like that's to- That's the only way. I mean, I, I don't think there is another option in this day and age. You know, with so many different touch points of communications and platforms and applications, and you can reach me on email and Telegram and WhatsApp and text, and I can't, keep, I can't, I can't even keep up with it all. Twitter, um, but I think that the only way that you can do that is to be omnichannel. I think without an omnichannel approach, personally or professionally, there's no option. But I think that's also another chance to give you as a brand opportunity for consistency, opportunity to alter your messages slightly. I worked for an 84-year-old brand, a legacy brand. Yeah. I've got a lot of consumers that love Lancôme. I have a lot of consumers that are older and that they'll never do anything else, they'll never use any other product but Lancôme. I've got some middle-of-the-road people like me that you could switch me, I could maybe come back. And then I've got these millennials that are like, my mom used Lancôme, <laughs> I, it's not yeah, cool, yeah, yeah. right? So now I can talk to these three audiences in three very different relevant ways at very specific places and times in manners that matter to them. So without that omni-channel approach, I just don't think that you can be yeah. a brand that's relevant. Awesome. Uh, Alex Renato, would you like to jump in? A hundred percent. As I said at the beginning, the consumer journey has become quite complex and customers do expect consistency across each and every touch point. They're gonna buy the same product from different retailers, different channels, they will check prices on social media and, you know, ask for recommendation uh, from their friends. So consistency is key. It's possible through a, a, a well-grounded brand that has a strong and solid personality, like you said, um, Alex. So, yeah, definitely. 100% agree. And I think there are a lot of brands that are already doing it. Um, and, and I think we can learn a lot as well from other types of industry, if I look at the sports industry, and you look, you follow your favorite team, Manchester United or Liverpool, Liverpool, <laughs> Liverpool. Um, Boston Red Sox, <laughs> they, Boston they, Red Sox. They do it incredibly well. So you can have the real life experience at the, at the stadium, you have the real life experience, whether you're watching it on any other media, and then when you go into their store, you get that experience as well. So I think it's definitely possible. Well, uh, given the fact that my Boston Red Sox won the World Series just two or three hours ago, I think that's a great point to end on. But I, I think it's also incredibly hopeful for the, in our industry, for the shopping mall industry, for the retail industry in the Gulf region, because, because if we can coordinate this online world and this offline world in an omni-channel way, um, and get the millennials on board and get the older people on board, I think we have potential to grow our businesses um, and, and rather than just pointing fingers and keeping in our little, uh, our little holes. So I want to thank very much our panel, uh, Stacy, Nada, thank and you. Alex. It's been great fun. Well, thank you to our moderator and our panelists for the fantastic discussion. Up next, the panel discussion is on environmental mall benchmarking project, why all shopping centers should be part of this project. 
The discussion will provide mall owners and operators with more visibility surrounding their industries, energy performance, water use, and waste generation. Let's please welcome back again to the stage our moderator, David McAdam. Let's welcome him with a big round of applause, please. Now, our first panelist, we have Sandrine Le Biavant, and she is the director consultancy of Frank, the Swiss UAE-based facilities management company, awarded several times as Green FM Company of the Year. Let's all welcome Sandrine, please, to the stage. Our next panelist, Abdullah Al Wahidi, Senior Director, Imar Properties. He has over 18 years of experience in infrastructure and facility management. He oversees the FM operation of Imar's integrated master planned communities, including iconic projects such as Burj Khalifa and the Dubai Mall. Welcome, Abdullah, on stage. And our third panelist, yes. Warm welcome. We've got Faisal Ali Rashid. His current job is Energy Demand Side Director in Dubai Supreme Council of Energy, looking after the whole energy demand sector of Dubai. Let's please all welcome him. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, our great panelists, please have a seat. Let's, uh, let's start on this. One of the things that we wanted to bring forward at this conference this year was um, talking about energy consumption as a major cost factor in the expense column of the shopping center management operations. But not only for the shopping centers, it's also for the retailers. For example, Carrefour's utility costs are 40% of their expenses, which I think is an amazing, expensive amount of money to operate. We are very fortunate today to have on our panel the foremost experts in the region and have been making, making great strides in making things, I think, simpler to recognize that there's an opportunity to save money, not only for your operations, but also regionally, and I'd say also as a planet. And I know Faisal and I, you and I were chatting just briefly about that. So let us um, start with Sandrine. Please provide us an overview of what this initiative is all about. Please. All right, thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the purpose of the uh, environmental mall benchmarking uh, was to provide a picture uh, to the um, operator and the developers of uh, shopping centers to understand where, uh, the, how they could set their targets in energy, water management, and we've also included waste uh, because we also realized that uh, it was very opaque and uh, um, no one knew exactly what is the best uh, case study, what are the, uh, the level that that should actually uh, have. So we have uh, initially uh, contacted uh, the mega malls of, uh, of Dubai who happily participated. And we found out that in average, uh, in uh, consumption, a uh, mall consumes 511 kilowatt hours per square meter. Now, is it good? Is it not good? The objective is not to judge. The objective is to give a reading to every mall to be able to know where they are at the moment and where they can go. So the best was actually around 350 kilowatt hours per square meter. Then for water, we've reached um, around 11 liters per visitor. And we found out that uh, around 70% of this water is consumed in a washroom. So that helps you to see that really this is an area where we could optimize. And for waste, it's around 500 uh, kilograms uh, sorry, per visitor. So our objective is, of course, to open uh, this study and uh, to, to welcome more molds, to be able to assess, you know, aside of the mega molds, what's, uh, what's the other trends, confirm, and give even more uh, specific study in the future. Thanks, Andrine. I think what's important to understand in the shopping center industry, I think for all of us to understand, is the fact that there's a tremendous amount of energy consumed and waste produced. And when you 
listen to these numbers that you're speaking about. Those are huge numbers, but give us an idea of context if you can. 511, 211, tell me what that means. Um, this means that uh, we found out the opportunity of saving for a mole in uh, energy, right, yes. uh, could reach uh, up to 50%. So you're saying that through the initiative that you're trying and establishing, we can see savings in consumption by 50, 50%, which is significant because that all goes down to the expense line and the bottom line at the end of the day. Yes. Okay. Let me, uh, let me ask maybe from a more global perspective. So Faisal, you, you are at the top of your game in the industry in what you do. You're trying to control and manage the energy for a growing city. And how do you do that and what do you see as a future for us? Yeah, I think in my opinion, this uh, topic of energy is uh, uh, for some of us are being taken for granted. I think if we know there is behind this a lot of uh, hard work in terms of whether it is a supply side management to see a city like Dubai it was growing basically significantly every year because of the, uh, the nature of the city, because of the nature of the economy that we have here. But a lot of this uh, is not seen. They take it as it's already there available. But behind the scene, there is a power generation that is being built uh, to make sure that we have a clean fossil fuel, then we have the re renewable, which is also, we are leading uh, the whole region in terms of capacity to sort of clean our supply side. Then comes, I think, the demand side management, which is uh, uh, basically uh, my responsibility to ensure that our consumption also uh, comes on top of the supply side, which, is we're, which we're trying to clean it. Uh, the demand side management, we, are, we have a target of reducing the consumption by 30% uh, on the horizon of 2030. And uh, this help us also uh, uh, make our building more sustainable, uh, basically make our building code sustainable. I will go the, basically quickly to the, some of the initiative that we have because of the time. Uh, one uh, initiative that Dubai uh, has uh, pursued is building retrofit uh, initiative uh, uh, because we have in Dubai around 135,000 building and mostly they are inefficient whether they are shopping mall or hotel or uh, different typology. So how to bring the consumption down instead of just building, spending money on the power generation which is not sustainable. So also to ensure that you make uh, your code uh, very efficient and then you tackle the existing building, whether it's a shopping mall, etc. Through this uh, initiative, which is a retrofit. Uh, and so far, since we have started, we have reached 3,000 building already uh, has been uh, gone through the retrofit. And our target is to reach uh, 30,000 building uh, being retrofitted, including the Big uh, mega projects like Dubai Airport uh, terminals, uh, it's more than 100 million projects, and then we have the DIFC in, du in Dubai, Jabal Ali, Jabal Ali Free Zone, Al uh, Wasal Real Estate, uh, uh, I think uh, DIWA also, uh, energy provider asset. So I think um, th these are some of the things that we're doing. I think I can, we can take uh, later on direct question as well. There is any sure. uh, anything specific? Sure. Happy to that. Tell me when you're speaking of retrofit, mm -hmm. what do you mean when you're retrofitting all mm -hmm. of these buildings? What mm -hmm. do you do? Mm -hmm. in, and is it manageable for mm -hmm. our people who own buildings mm -hmm. here in shopping centers? Yeah. Is it something mm -hmm. they should get yes. into? Yeah. Uh, the way we look at it is the uh, enabler. I think before you pursue anything, you have to look at the enabler. So we already have the energy performance contract, which is basically taken from the word practice. and. Then uh, the second point, we already have the, uh, the ESCOs market already have been developed in Dubai, whether it is for public or government building, whether it is for commercial building. We already built a model that you don't have, uh, you don't have, uh, you don't need to have access to capital. I think you can basically uh, work it out through the energy bill to uh, basically invest in your building you'll get a maximum guarantee uh, of your saving, whether it is 30%, whether it is uh, more than 30%, this is part of the contract. 
So I think there is no excuse for whether it is a small or big building since uh, there is a model already there. And for government entities, it's a different model. We already connecting with them through a mandate. Uh, it's different, but for the commercial building, the door is open, it's more on a voluntary basis. So there are already initiatives in place. You've been successful with that. It is possible for everyone to get onto the bandwagon and start more of an energy uh, conservation. So, Abdullah, you are associated with the EMAR group and you are responsible for one of, I'm sure, one of the largest energy consumers probably in Dubai. Please explain what your role is and what you've been doing with this initiative. Well, you know, a few years ago, I was in a, speaking in a conference about the, uh, the need to establish uh, benchmarking information, not just related to utilities, but also related to uh, maintenance practices in general. And, uh, you know, it took quite a number of years until we are, we are today standing here and, and talking about the benchmarking. Uh, it's so valuable, and I look at it in, in a very simple terminology, just to simplify it. It's like Google Map. You put an address where you want to go. The first thing that it does, it identifies where you stand today. The benchmarking exercise is it identifies where do we stand today, and then you as a mall operator or an, an energy consumer, you decide on the action plan required and what needs to be done and how you prioritize uh, the activities in order to achieve or be in line or reach your destination. Uh, in our case, um, you know, we've, we've had uh, assets which are beyond the benchmark. Uh, they're not doing well in terms of consumption, but there are assets that are very good. So when we, have, when we look at you know, funding and allocating of projects and, and cost allocations, we always you know, prioritize the assets that require more work and more investment. And instead of just focusing um, on you know, the, the other assets which does not require a lot of uh, work. So that's how we see the benefits. It's establishing where we stand and then you know, allocating the funds to the right place, especially in a time where uh, resources are limited, funds are limited, and there is a requirement to reduce costs everywhere. Thank you, and I think Sandrine, maybe you can help us out on this as well, maybe shed some light. One of the things that um, I think people want to understand is if they're going to get behind this initiative, how hard, how easy, how do we do it, what's the next step? Because if you can save 50% of the consumption and energy that's in your shopping center, I know as an owner I would want to immediately subscribe because that goes right to your bottom line. I mean, it's a great, a great initiative. Tell us more. Well, in the case of uh, the shopping centers that we've been working with, they already had an energy management plan in place. Yes. Um, and they've been driving this for many years. Uh, but in uh, other scenarios, what we offer is actually a journey. You can't get 50% in one day, that's for sure. Okay. So where is it that you standing is going to be uh, what you will discover through the benchmarking, and then you can design what is going to be the plan and, and the target. Um, but the questionnaire is uh, very simple. We're asking for the electricity consumption, the chilled water consumption if you have. Um, uh, mainly, we're also asking you for the air-conditioned area, the leasing, uh, gross leasing area, so we get, can make some comparisons for the KPIs, uh, the footfall, and, of course, the water consumption. It could be TSC water as well. Okay. Uh, and that could be condensate water. So we are, every mall is going to have its own scenario that we are actually aggregating, and every mall is going to be uh, benchmarked with the same category. So, of course, a, a community uh, a shopping mall, shopping center is not going to be benchmarked with a super mall. Um, and, of course, we are going to integrate the waste. So we just need the general waste and the uh, recycled waste. So on an annual base. Just so you've been simple. doing this for some time then because you've got all of these uh, policies, procedures in place. Yeah. What is it that's going to make a difference for all of the shopping center owners here to want to subscribe and jump in? I know we've talked about the savings of energy. What else is there? Maybe let's go down here, Abdullah. Tell us well, what is your benefit for besides, joining up. See, besides the savings, we have the social responsibility towards the country, towards the environment that we need to look at. And, and that's something that we should focus on, not just focus on the money part. 
you know, by having more people participating and more malls participating in this exercise, the accuracy of the information and the accuracy of the benchmark will improve and that will help in decision making. So it's that collective effort that is needed. And then the other thing that I look at is why wait until the government comes in 2021 and say, you know, you need to reduce your energy consumption. Well, I don't have to wait until that day. I, st I should start from today and help the government achieve the goal. We, the government for so many years has been leading, uh, you know, the private sector and the private sector now in, in a position that it should also be as fast as the government sector. So mm -hmm. um, working together is, is the key message, I would say. And, uh, you know, the ultimate goal is to serve the country and, and give back. Excellent. Thank you. I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, Faisal, maybe from the, the government's perspective, how is it best that one or two or five or ten people and their organizations can get behind you and the government initiative? Mm -hmm. What is it we can do to help them get on board with this whole initiative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, uh, I tell you about the benchmarking, uh, which is a very powerful tool. Uh, China in the past used to consume four times average of unit of GDP. Today they are half the world average. I think when we look at the benchmark, which uh, my colleague has mentioned, uh, and then we'll, we're able to compare our consumption, our behavior, our also um, um, average uh, uh, oil equivalent also consumption, that's, that's another thing. So there are so many parameters that we can look at. So building the data, uh, whether it starts here from the shopping mall and then it gets aggregated in terms of average consumption uh, in the city and the UAE as well and then compare it with others, especially within our, with our, within our region. We cannot compare uh, uh, what we have here with the, some of the European countries because they have different uh, environments. They don't have the, 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 the harsh weather that we have. So I would say uh, one thing is the initiative that we, uh, you have asked me before. What should we do? I think uh, the policy is our responsibility to ensure that we, uh, we believe in uh, sustainable policy. Uh, we connect with the community when it comes to policy. And then comes the awareness as well to ensure that we make the community, whether it is com commercial, national, non-national, make them aware of the consumption, consumption aware, aware of the uh, utility and uh, what have you. And of course the technology, we, uh, every, uh, I think year we conduct big energy conference, whether it is WATEX, the World Green Economy Summit, whether it is a future energy summit in Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. to ensure that the, the advancement, the technology is also there and is available for these uh, big organization basically to use and utilize. So the government is there and the doors are open, so you're ready to accept all of this. Now, Sandrine, um, we could ask for some questions in the audience. Does anybody have any questions on this, first of all? No? Okay, let me go to Sandrine one more time. I'm thinking that um, this just makes sense. So why wouldn't we subscribe to this initiative, measure our consumption, and make the savings by saving the government for what they're having to consume and produce for our consumption, and also for making it for the planet a better place. Why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> so th the way Farnac is, is working uh, with our engineers is really to make the life simple for the decision makers uh, and create a, a, a new way of looking at the data. So uh, we have actually developed a, a website for registration uh, which is retail.optimizer. Uh, and um, I want to emphasize that behind the statistics that are being provided, your data is going to be also validated um, uh, uh, and by energy managers. So behind there is a lot of uh, engineering and okay. knowledge behind to, uh, to provide the statistics and be able to compare apples with apples, like we like to say. So you're saying then that you've created an app or a, some kind of a link that you can get involved with this thing very easily, very easily. and just start. Do you want to repeat what that is again, please? Or do you have something oh, that you can... I have brochures for the one who are interested uh, with the statistics of the last survey and uh, also uh, the, the, the www.retail.com. 
optimizer.com. Panel, thank you very much. Abdullah, thank you for your thank time. You. Sandrine, for yours. And, and Faisal, thank, thank you for you. coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, ladies thank and gentlemen. You. All right, thank you to our uh, moderator and uh, panelists for the very lively discussion. Now we're on to our last uh, panel of the day, and a panel discussion would revolve around what makes F&B sustainable in the retail environments of MENA region shopping experience. Our panel will discuss what is necessary to have successful food components in the retail environment today. Let's please all welcome to the stage our moderator, Alexis Marcus Varvatis Solas. Please welcome him to the stage. And he leads the Food Service Consulting MENA division and is the client contact in charge of FMB projects and collaborations with the wider GLL teams to produce accurate and informative FMB strategy reviews. Let's welcome our moderator. Big round of applause. Yeah. Our first panelist, we have Michael Perchfield, and he's the vice chairman and co-leads JLS uh, National Retail Tenant Services Group, a specialty service practice focused on expanding the firm's retail tenant representation capabilities. Let's welcome Michael from GLLS, please. And our next panelist is Paul Firth and he's a Senior Associate Director in Callison RTKLS Dubai office, where he manages the shopping and entertainment practice group. With over 26 years of architectural experience, his portfolio includes vibrant and successful retail mixed-use environments throughout the Middle East and Europe. Big round of applause to Paul, please. <laughs> right. And we have Anoop Gopal, and he's the experienced retail and shopping mall industry professional in both leasing and brand real estate development with over 13 years experience in the Middle East and India. Welcome and up on stage. He is the retail real estate expansion for Americana franchise brands for the MENA region. Last but not least, we have Daniel Perry and he's the managing director and general Council at a golf related. Just to name a few of his legal responsibilities, it includes negotiating real estate acquisitions and joint venture agreements, establishing and overseeing real estate funds, establishing and executing retail leasing program. Please welcome all our panelists. sound. Everybody's gone to lunch. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. I'm sure everybody's hungry at the moment. <laughs> this is a nice topic. Exactly. So welcome to this F&B panel. Thankfully, you cannot eat online. So you guys are still here, fully aware we have lunch just after this panel. So bear with us. Uh, we'll discuss food a little bit, make you all hungry, and then we'll move on to lunch. So I have the honor to be here with a great panel, a great panelist, and thank you for joining us all. We, I have six questions for them. I'll an address each question to one person, and then we'll open up for questions afterwards and comments from the rest of the panelists. So the first question is for you, Anoop, and is the great design in F&B units is very important in order to keep brands fresh and appealing. So I just wanted to know how is your experience in trends in design that work in uh, great F&B operations? I mean, Americana as a company has been um, in the Middle East for the last 40 plus years. Um, we operate 1,900 plus restaurants across 10 countries. Um, always, even though a lot of our brands are organized retail, mainly franchise brands, Bigger brands like KFC, Hardee's, Pizza Hut, Krispy Kreme, TGI Fridays, and so on. 
Um, there is a lot of competition uh, in the market, a lot of new innovations come in. So, and people travel a lot. Dubai is, and especially UAE and the Middle East, is one of those areas that a lot of youngsters who travel around the world, and they see a lot of new concepts. And uh, if we don't innovate ourselves every time, uh, we kind of uh, go back, and then uh, there are a lot of other leaders who will come in front. Um, so, as, as mentioned, as per your question, um, we have done a lot of innovation, um, and I think there was a panel before talking about environment and everything, and we're also taking to those aspects too. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that we did is that we, we, we work very close with international brands, so we closed very close with Yum. Um, just a few months ago in Dubai Mall Fashion Extension, uh, we opened uh, the newest KFC um, and the Pizza Hut in Hard East. I don't know how many of you guys have actually visited the store, it's totally different than what we actually offer it anywhere in the world, even anywhere in the world. I mean, that's the first kind of product type of unit that we opened. And this particular unit that we opened is something that we did uh, with our local team and with Yum Architects and international team, worked together and developed this concept. So the concepts nowadays are very different. They want to be open spaces, uh, less clutters. Uh, the kitchens, they want to be showcased. People want to see what's being cooked so before, mm -hmm. um, I think if you walk into any food court or you walk into any restaurant, you can't see the kitchen. Um, it's pretty closed. Nowadays, people like to see the kitchen. So if you go to my Pizza Hut shop, unlike the other Pizza Hut that I see, you can see pretty much all the, all the stuff that's been made. You can freshly see the dough being made. You can freshly see the pizza being made. So I think it's all about um, touch and feel. Yep. Um, and I think people, I think I know that Michael is there um, and, our, and I think Paul with RTKL, they all know, can always concur about it. I'm sure Daniel is coming up with a new shopping center. Um, so a lot of new innovation stuff is required for us to um, innovate ourselves and be the leaders. Um, and also it, if it's required to tweak a bit, like TGI Fridays, we open in Row Hotel downtown. Um, that's the first uh, concept we open in a hotel. So we kind of uh, did the agreement with them where we're also serving breakfast. Um, we we also doing shisha. We're doing different kinds of kinds. So we, we fine-tune based on the people's requirement. So I think that's very important. So flexibility yeah. and adaptability to the changing market. Yeah, yeah that's, that's certainly very important from my point of view in terms of the, the centers that we design. We've been in the region for the past 15, 20 years now. And one of the biggest things that we found is overall flexibility to enable our tenants to be able to carry out these kind of chains not just on a base bill, but on an energy provision point of view as well, in terms of all of those important provisions. So, I'm guessing the, the, it starts from the design on how the brand expectations come to you as a designer it, it, too. It, it's really all about the customer experience from arriving at the car park of the public transport, moving through to the inner circulation, and then how you experience each of the offerings. And we call it really, it's food as theater. Um, it's so important to get that brand experience, the brand story, you know, from a master developer point of view to be able to carry it through all of the center um, to really enable each of the tenants to operate individually within their own brand, but also to contribute to a successful environment overall. Very good. And that brings me, uh, that's a great introduction <laughs> to the next question on, you know, how our experience shows that F&B units are getting mm. smaller, uh, including retail, but let's stick to, yeah. to F&B. Yeah. The need for F&B has grown, but the, the, the actual space is getting smaller. And I wanted your experience as a designer yeah. of spaces for people. We've got quite a few projects on site at the moment. And what's interesting, both from a retailing and an F&B point of view, nothing is ever the same every day. Um, we work from a master planning uh, point of view and kind of a, a detailed planning point of view. Flexibility is key. So currently at the moment, in terms of F&B, depending on whether it's fast casual or slow casual or dining, what have you, we're looking at units from basically a small one, small kiosk of 10 meters, up to something maybe 350, something like that. Right. Um, obviously in markets like Saudi, it tends to change. Um, but the important thing is, what we, it's not just the physical space in terms of the amount of plan area, it's the experience as well in terms of connectivity to the mall, um, in terms of how the units are laid out. Also shop fronts as well, Sig we find that becoming a significant change. When I first started working on projects in the region kind of 15, 20 years ago, 
we were looking at very much a traditional mall experience. Now everything is much more open, you know, shop fronts are fading away. There's a current trend at the moment in terms of kind of industrial design, which is very popular. Um, that seems to be spreading around at the market. And obviously it's very cheap, it's much cheaper as well in terms of base build and also tenant provision. Um, so all of those things point towards it. And it's not just the um, physical attributes of an overall space as well, it's how we service those units as well. And we, we've got several projects on site at the moment. We've been through the plans at the very early planning phases, located all of the F&B. I can pretty much tell you there won't be an F&B in any of those spots, so it drives our engineers crazy. Everything changes, and that's the important thing. It's, it's reaction to market, reaction to change. You know, if a cinema tenant relocates or an entertainment tenant relocates, the food clustering around that is important in terms of to get the connectivity, in terms of the synergy between all of the adjacent units. Sorry, there used to be a time, um, I think, when long, long, long time ago, mm -hmm. I mean, long, not really long mm -hmm. time, I mean, two, three years ago, where the FNB percentage in shopping malls, mm -hmm. in, in centers, probably about 9 to 10%. Um, scenarios are now changing. I think FNB has become a very important element into a lot of retail, a lot of shopping mall development. So I'm seeing a lot of new projects come up, and they're coming up to 22%. Uh, so when you have a scale of 22% of FNB offering, uh, the idea of we, tena we tenants mm -hmm. as retail have to think about going down in our size yeah. uh, because the volume of business will be the same. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the number of customers will be, the footfall will be the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to reduce the size. You need to reduce. So this is what we always tell to the landlords that we need to look at having smaller locations, yep. utilize it well, even utilize the height well. Yep. Uh, probably not take, like I can, I can operate a KFC at 50, probably 65 to 70 square meter if I have a storage space outside. Yep. Um, so I can work that out. So my storage rent will be much cheaper than I actually pay off for a, for a normal food court. So we need to look at all kinds of elements when it comes to, um, that, that forces us to also go as well, well, what's what's interesting, when I first started working on these kind of projects, which was a long time ago, we used to have a food court and that was it. Now it's literally you have everything and it just builds on the whole experience because the important thing is customers are important to the end of the day, keeping them entertained, making them stay, you know, we, and social interaction is obviously becoming important as well. We're now seeing um, Generation X and Alpha coming through. So giving people the opportunities, obviously culturally it's different around the region, but giving people the opportunities to interact, to be private when they want, and that leads us to different seating configurations, um, different format layouts. You know, the, the cooking is theater is, is a big one at the moment, which we're quite excited about in terms of, as Anup said, in terms of making the kitchen very visible, which is important because people do want a turnaround on experience. You know, the age of the kind of old F&B has just gone away now, and anybody that still thinks in that mindset isn't reacting to what the market needs. I also, I also think you end up with a challenge when mm -hmm. you have the size of the unit shrinking, but you have the percentage of a project devoted to F&B growing. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure for new concepts. It also creates a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs who can figure out a new food concept or a new mm -hmm. way of presenting an old food concept. Uh, because now the challenge becomes there's more space you have to lease to yeah. yeah, there's more space. The space is changing. I think we've heard it a lot today on, on entertainment, and we call it for the F&B dinnertainment. And I think, Daniel, uh, on, on how those changes, both the design and the need of the F&B brands, it, it would be very interesting to hear how, how you adapt to those needs of, of the different requirements for that entertainment. Thanks. I think it depends on your project and who your target audience is. We started in Abu Dhabi nine years ago now at the Galleria, which people hopefully know, but we know it's two million square feet of mixed-use office, Four Seasons, Rosewood. And when we went to the F&B, we started with Zuma, because we knew Zuma was our target for the Galleria. And when we talked to them, we right-sized it. People talk about shrinking and supersizing and that. It's, it's right-sized for who your market is. And then with Le Petit Maison and Nursret, you know, we worked with them to create the right size. And we knew that was our target. We want the business person for lunch. We want the people coming there for dinner. And that was important to their business plan. As we do our Maria Central, that's a totally different mix. We're building it for the people of Abu Dhabi. And we took food into it on the in very early stages. So we created central kitchens. And, and we knew that food was a big part of malls, um, we're about 20, 22%, so it's yeah. right in what Newt was saying. But we've created central kitchens, which allows those small entrepreneurs with low cost fit outs to come and try food. It's more like a, a food truck experience. But then when we worked with bringing our shire into the mall, 
and you're talking to the cheesecake factories or the PF chains, again, they're a different size, a different operator to bring that enhanced experience. Um, so it really, as a, as a developer, you've got to look at who your customer is and how much. And the fewer fast food, we've got, I think, 11 in Central. Central Kitchens, we've got 25. And then the Galleria, we have 14 of the best F&B uh, destinations you can find under one roof. It's great to hear how you're adapting, especially those centralized kitchens. They, they allow for, for a lower rent for those new concepts to come along, which we're going to touch upon in a little bit uh, later on. And, you know, Michael, across the world, and, you know, you come from the U.S., so Sears is quite, quite fresh on the news. We've seen high rents and, and big spaces coming back in the market. And with, with those high rents, we, we found sometimes in shopping centers there's a little bit of, of lack of creativity because uh, the new brands, as Daniel was saying, uh, cannot come in. So I just wanted to know your experience with how a, a new brand can come in and, and succeed in a very competitive market. Well, I think there are two uh, formulas that you see playing out. Um, and I mean, the relative comment of high rents, the rent isn't high if you're obviously doing the business. Uh, but the risk is high, okay, based upon what, what the, the inherent economics right now of, of development pretty much anywhere in the world are. I, we're seeing uh, two phenomena. One is, um, you know, and it's not, it's not unique to the U.S., far from it, but you get these very large food halls mm -hmm. uh, done by, you know, uh, often a very famous chef will, will be the sponsor of it. Italy is sort of the one that I think most people have, have heard about. Um, and they're, at this point, obviously a, a global force. But you're also getting other food halls either devoted to a particular uh, a French food hall or, or a Spanish food hall. But you're also getting ones in centers that are, that are sort of uh, a very nice sort of collaboration between restaurants and actual uh, food products for sale. The larger spaces let those tenants drive rents and drive the types of deals that they get. We're also seeing a lot of developers much more willing to contribute um, a reasonable part of the cost okay. of construction. Um, you know, they generally these leases do contain uh, turnover provisions, so there is a potential return on investment to the developer. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing is that when we see some of these big boxes come back, uh, a big department store box attached to a regional mall, they will often open up that box. They will now make that box open to the outside, which creates a uh, almost a sense of community. And that is very often being occupied by outward facing, but also inward accessible F and B, which is what the consumer wants because they want a place that they can go and be social. And, mm -hmm. and we're seeing more of that too. So social plays a, a big role in, in the visiting That's of a shopping center or an F and B destination. It, it, it kind of what I was talking to earlier. The social aspects are so important now. You know, malls, mixed use projects, shopping centers aren't just places to go eat and shop. They're places to hang out, and we all need to respond to that to create the storyline, to create the brand, to build on that. And it's interesting, Michael, should bring that up about the food halls and the conversions. We've got a couple of projects in the region at the moment. Can't tell you where they are, but we're looking at that kind of concept right now in terms of taking existing an existing uh, unit and converting it to a food hall and we've also got other projects where the landlord is going to develop the food hall concept themselves so we're assisting them in terms of how we pull that together and what's nice about that you get an authenticity which is really quite nice it's something different something fresh you know you can work with the retailers the restaurateurs so it becomes like a food hall stroke a delicatessen expression as well so okay so to, to my understanding food hall you know they, they are coming in and they are here to stay there's some markets that have evolved a lot quicker than others but they, it's, they're coming here to the, to the region and, and they're going to they're gonna hit the region very hard. And it's a, it's a, it, it takes a lot of boxes, as in the entertainment, the sociability of it, yeah. the, the multitude of choice. It, it's a great concept that, so that is... That's so one of the things I'm success. not sure, I'm sorry, one of the things I'm sure whether... I've seen in the U.S. and other countries a lot of concepts like David Buster's, mm -hmm. uh, which yep. is more of entertainment and food element together. I haven't seen much of concepts 
um, been open yet. I don't know whether I've, I've, I've not seen a lot of this concept with the FNB and entertainment open in one box. Um, mm -hmm. um, well, there, there are they're a coming. number of they're them. Coming. I mean, there are uh, in, in yeah. UAE, uh, I mean, in Dubai, in uh, the Middle East. Well, I, I think we have indoors by Imagine Alpha Yeah, that's which something that's open recently. Yes. But I'm talking about as, a, as an international brand like Dave and Buster's. I think there's a lot of potential of those kind mm -hmm. of brands uh, to take these big boxes mm -hmm. and fit in the FNB with entertainment. Yeah. Uh, I think that's something probably people need to look at innovating. So and probably the entertainment guys need to get into F&B too. And well, it's, sorry, go ahead. Ahead. No, it's food as theater, as we were saying before. So the, the concept of bringing the food into the entertainment and, and bringing the two together extends the stay. You know, we've looked at project, existing projects in the UAE, actually, I've got to be careful what I say, in the <laughs> GCC, where we've looked at driving cinemas and things like that in terms of locating that kind of thing. And that works very well with the F&B split as well in terms of a, uh, a kind of a complementary use. Because really, we need to encourage people to stay, but you've got to give them the different storyline each time. It's, you know, getting back to you talking about the leases and the flexibility. One thing I've been trying to persuade um, clients to do is for, for kind of young startups in terms of F&Bs to have a unit already fixed in place. The D was already sorted out. There's already seats. There's already a kitchen already in the back. So literally some young chef from somewhere, whether it's local or international, whatever, can just come along and cook for six months and then it refreshes itself constantly. It was exciting, good to see Daniel what was talking about in terms of the central say, kitchens. All the things you're talking about is exactly what we're doing at Amari Central. Oh, okay. We've got food in the entertainment. We have mm -hmm. an incredible box cinema. I know Cameron was up here earlier. With an, we've built an outdoor balcony for him, for the F&B in there. Our entertainment, which we haven't announced to market, that's got F&B in it. Um, we've got five parks in the project, public parks. You can come. We're not forcing you to spend money. It's air-conditioned car park. Um, go and enjoy the park, but we've got food on the park. So we're creating the space. And then, as you said, it's sort of the mostly prepared kitchen. So we can yep. have the guy in it, whether it's six months or 12 months. If it's working, great, stay. And you might progress to a full-time one because yep. you're right. The investment from a developer these days is a lot of money. And the risk is huge. And, and so we're happy as a developer to take some risk on some up-and-coming chefs and, and, and work with them to hopefully grow them in the future, so to incubate them. Perfect. And uh, in terms of, you know, mixed-use developments have great F&B opportunities. We, we see a lot of creativity coming in mixed-use development with F&B. Outside of, of that flexibility, what, what other aspect does a development need to, to offer in order to be attractive to those F&B operators and create a, a true destination in terms of uh, entertainment, leisure, yeah, so we only do mixed use. I don't know how many people know Related from the US. Um, we're a very large developer, possibly the largest private developer in the world now. We have uh, operations in London and across in the States. For instance, New York's a $25 billion project, which is Hudson Yards. That is a true mixed use project. So we have about seven, 800,000 square feet of retail, incredible F&B. Um, we're building the Equinox Hotel. We've got residential office, um, so we, we, we believe uh, people might know the vessel. If not, have a Google next time you're in New York after spring, go and look at it. So we, we create mixed-use projects, big, large-scale mixed-use projects, similar to what we're doing here in Abu Dhabi. We want the office. We want the residential. We want to create the, and, and the tourism because they all work together. And quite frankly, the F&B guys want them together as well because they want to know they've got someone coming in the morning, they might have the mums coming, then they've got the business coming for lunch, then they got the families in the afternoon and again at night time. So you, you're spreading out, instead of a six hour selling window, you've got 12 or 15 hour selling window. That's what we specialize in, it's big large scale mixed use. And from an F&B person, that's the least risky project because I'm bringing footfall in of all categories of all types all day long. So it's like baking a cake, the recipe needs to be correct in order for the cake to Absolutely. succeed. Absolutely, we wouldn't do a project as a standalone. Perfect. So let's talk a little bit about trends and especially sustainability. I know we, we were uh, just before us, there was a whole sustainability pattern, but you can't talk F&B without discussing sustainability nowadays. And I'm, I'm going to ask you, Anu, on food packaging and how, what is the key to its sustainability? I know uh, food packaging is quite difficult to be sustainable because it needs to be able to sustain heat, and, and what, what are the trends, you know, we've seen the, 
the plastic straw come going out the window for a, a lot of companies and how is this going to look like in five years? I think everybody knows that global warming is one of the most key topics the next 10, I mean at this point of time every time people say that there is 10 more years for us to reverse the climate change. Uh, so I think we all uh, retailers, landlords, um, developers, everybody's responsible. We customers, are, we people are responsible. Um, I'm not saying that we, we, have, we, we are way ahead uh, in terms of how much we have done in t uh, for, for these kind of efforts, but we started. Uh, recently, we have done efforts like online ordering. Uh, we have put up a small kind of a tab where they can click and choose whether they want, they want to have straw, do, you want, do they want to have a cl uh, cutleries, do they want to have uh, the tomato ketchup sachets. Um, so if the customer doesn't want it, then uh, they don't need to order. So it's, it's, it's in a way um, not wasting because a lot of the times when you deliver food, people they eat food in, the, in their house and usually they would like to drink in their own cup mm -hmm. or they don't want to drink it from the, from the things or uh, they don't want to use the tomato ketchup sachet because they have a different kinds of sauces in their house. So I think we, we will have to um, uh, change those kind of elements. So we're trying. Number two, we're even trying in, in, in improving in our packaging. Uh, we want to use a lot of recycled uh, bags. Um, I think um, McDonald's and a few other people have already started. We've already started doing it. We've, we're studying very closely with Yum. We're studying very closely with other guys. And we're working it out to how we can uh, do recycled uh, mm. bags and recycled stuff so that we don't, um, you know, we have to do our efforts. Uh, this is what we are doing. Um, and also, um, the other biggest challenge that we all have in this part of the world, especially um, for some reason, international brands, their power requirements are going up. Okay. And I'm not sure uh, what's the real reason. Probably it's got to do with the fact that they've got a lot of new equipments being brought in. Uh, so when you have new equipments brought in, the power requirements goes out. New, new food comes to your menu, you add a new equipment to your kitchen that increase your power requirement. So naturally, when you go for a unit and you ask the landlord, I need 250 kilowatts to run a food court unit, they go, they're gonna say, I, I'm, not, I'm not crazy to give that kind of power. So, I mean, we, we're talking to internationals and telling them to see how we can reduce the power consumption. We are, we are going for container concept where we wanted to do sustainable solar energy okay. in probably running some of our equipments, some of our stuff, maybe air conditioning, lights, those kind of elements. So we are getting there. I'm not, I'm not saying we are there, but we're getting there. But I'm sure one of the main focus of Americana now is to focus on working this element into a better. And also food waste, I think, is a critical thing, which is also yeah. being worked out. I was going to say, from a design, point, design team point of view, you know, several projects that we've got in the play at the moment, the, the kind of main developer is considering food composting. Obviously, all waste gets separated in terms of food courts and retail, but looking at the possibility of using uh, a large-scale food composter, either for one very large project or grouping um, a series of wa the waste from a series of projects together, and then they can actually feed that back to the grid in terms of generating methane, which will then obviously generate electricity. And also in terms of what you were talking about, solar energy, we're finding at the moment that um, in terms of our MEP colleagues, you know, locating plants and what have you in terms of it's actually economical, and we see these are projects that have been refurbished recently. It's, it's very economical to install solar panels on the roof, which not only screen the equipment, but it's, um, it's a great thing in terms of selling the electricity back to the grid, and obviously you get some return. I think the payback period is something like five years overall, which obviously, uh, and it's a great um, social responsibility approach as well, which is good. So it changes the design and, and the way uh, brands operate. Yeah. And, and we're also, in terms of how we design projects now, the engineering is very important in terms of how we cool the spaces and how we distribute the power and energy as well. Um, and you know, if we've had conversations with retailers recently where we said, well, you can't have 250, you can maybe have 100. <laughs> so it does get a, a bit of a challenge sometimes. So, so let's stay on the sustainability mm -hmm. side and, and talk about the, the actual food itself. So we've seen a lot of seasonal ingredients come more and more present on the menus. We've seen a decrease in animal protein and, and an increase in, in more healthy uh, lifestyle. Now, there's a, a discussion about this being a trend, this being uh, a fad, is it here to stay? I just want to understand how does this has affected the brand, the development, because more fresh food, more, more you know, cooked to order requires uh, more, more, more MEPs, it, it 
more space. How how are those food trends affecting your your business? And uh, please, anyone who they're, they're uh, not helping our business. Um, <laughs> we, as Anoop said, every tenant, every F and B guy wants more and more power, yeah. and we have a finite amount. We get allocated yeah. a finite amount, and and to upsize, you got to find it from somewhere, and you got to rob Peter to pay Paul. So it really is a struggle with the the retailers to to agree on what the mix is. When we started the project or AMC six years ago, we looked at and benchmarked the industry, what they're doing. We added some cushion, but we we got it wrong, and we've had to actually upgrade and, and supersize all of our power to deal with what's going on. But I don't think it's a fad. I don't. I think it's a it's a way of life. It's a lifestyle that we're seeing. We have created in in central kitchens, and, and it is it's our food hall. It was created by David Rockwell. Um, we, we themed it around a house, and one is the garden. I mean, and that's where you've got your healthy lifestyle choices. So this is something we've just had to cop on the chin as we've provisioned for the future, because the future is a mix of entertainment, food, and retail. So, so, sorry. sorry. Um, so millennials, that's the future, right? So a lot of people, Facebook, all the kinds of stuff, they are into up. Uh, they're very cautious. The youngsters are very cautious in their food. I think um, a lot of them are, are emphasizing on things like yoga and um, you know, uh, go and do some kind of exercise and stuff on a daily basis. Um, probably I'm not the right person to talk about it, but still, um, I think um, a, lot of the, a lot of the youngsters are, are, are into it. And one of the food things that we see is that there are a lot of requests for vegan food, a um, lot of requests for grilled food rather than um, you know, oil, oil made um, kitchen food. Um, so, for instance, we recently this year we, we launched the veggie burger for Hardee's. Uh, we never had a veggie burger in Hardee's. Hardee's was supposed to be hardcore uh, Angus burger kind of concept. So we had to change mm -hmm. because a lot of people were coming and asking. Uh, so we're losing the customers to McDonald's. We're losing the customers to Burger King and other people. So we actually launched um, um, the veggie burger. So what I'm trying to say is people are more innovative. You can see now a lot of the fast food people... Yeah, they emphasize on, 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 on health, on the kind of elements they put into the food. Um, salads is, is something that they put in the menu nowadays before they were not there. So I think even, uh, even if you go to Hardee's, you've got three kinds of fries. Uh, you know, got skin fries, you've got curly fries, you've got, <laughs> you got the normal fries. So <laughs> people are being more choosy. So we, we, we're changing a lot of things. So we are trying to innovate ourselves and we're trying to change things based on the requirement. I think there's an emphasis on freshness as well. We've, we've seen it in a couple of projects that have been completed recently where, recently where the concept of garden to table is very important. So there's either a vertical garden somewhere within the development or plans for it. Now, whether it's operated by the tenant or operated by the landlord, and we're, we're seeing more of that coming through as well. So in terms of growing vegetables on site, obviously it's a challenge in this part of the world, but it's something that we see happening in Europe and the US, and we think that's it's definitely on its way. It's really just talking about the freshness. And so people want to understand the legacy of their food and where it's come from. And I think that's maybe not so important for fast food, but certainly for the kind of mid to higher level, it's definitely important. Perfect. I'd like to open the panel to any questions from the floor, if there's any. Or are you all waiting to just go to lunch? When's lunch, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your insight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Hey. Right. Thank you to our panelists and moderator for this fantastic discussion. And thank you for those of you who are still hanging in here, although it's lunchtime. It's finally lunchtime, and I want to thank our coffee break and lunch sponsor, that is Line Investment Properties, LLC. And I want to invite you all for lunch. It's at Cara Restaurant on the P level. Thank you very much, and I look forward to see you tomorrow and the next day of the conference. Have a good day. Thank you, and goodbye. Just uh, before you go, once again, thanks to Line Investments for the support for the lunch and supporting the lunch and other things for us. Um, we are having our annual general meeting for all of our members. Uh, you have to be a current member, and that's starting at 3 o'clock, so lots of time for lunch, but then if you could come back around 3 o'clock, 
will host our annual general meeting, and it should be about uh, five to 15 minutes, roughly. And it's just a, what of the things that we need to do to be a recognized organization. But enjoy your lunch. It's in the Cara restaurant, level P for Paul, on the uh, mezzanine level. Thank you. Located at the heart of Dubai lies Cityland Mall, redefining retail, entertainment and green sustainability. Well positioned on the E311, Cityland Mall has a catchment to more than one million of the city's most affluent residents and direct access to key visitor attraction, Global Village. With over 350 fashion and retail brands, a 14-screen cinema, unique family entertainment center, and Dubai Land's largest international hypermarket, Cityland Mall will serve the community in every sense when it opens in 2018. There is covered parking for more than 6,000 cars, while the planned metro line, bus terminus, and highway interchange will further attract both residents and visitors. Cityland Mall's innovative interior design reflects the multicultural nature of Dubai itself, with six distinct cultural pavilions, each designed to create the perfect ambiance. 